Chapter Nineteen of the Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter Nineteen: The Reappearance of His Grace of Andover. It seemed to Richard in the days that followed. The Captain Lovelace was never out of his house. If he went to his wife's boudoir, there was Lovelace, hanging over her while she played upon the spinet, or glanced through the pages of the Rambler. If Lavinia went to a ball or masquerade, the Captain was always amongst the favoured ones, admitted to her chamber for the express purpose of watching her don her gown and judiciously place her patches. If Carstairs begged his wife's company one morning, she was full of regrets. Harry was calling to take her to Vauxhall, or to Spring Gardens. When he entered his room, the first sight that met his eyes was the captain's amber-clouded cane and pointed-edged hat. And, when he looked out of the window, it was more often to see a chair draw up at the house and Lovelace alight. After patiently enduring a week of his continued presence, Carstairs remonstrated with his wife. She must not encourage her friend to spend all his time at Grosvenor Square. At first she had looked reproachful, and then she inquired his reason. His reluctant answer was that it was not seemly. At that her eyes opened wide, and she demanded to know what could be more seemly than the visits of such an old friend. With a gleam of humour, Richard replied that it was not Captain Harold's age that he objected to, but on the contrary, his youth, on which she accused him of being jealous. It was true enough but he indignantly repudiated the suggestion. Very well, then, he was merely stupid. He must not be cross. Harry was her very good friend, and did not Richard admire the new device for her hair? Richard was not to be cajoled. Did she clearly understand that Lovelace's visits must cease? She only understood one thing, and that was that Dicky was marvellous, ill-tempered, and ridiculous to-day, and he must not tease her. Yes, she would be very good, but so must he, and now she was going shopping, and she would require at least twenty guineas. In spite of her promise to be good, she made no attempt to discourage Lovelace's attentions, always smiling charmingly upon him, and beckoning him to her side. It was the morning of the Duchess of Devonshire's rout that Carstairs again broached the subject. My lady was in bed, her fair hair unpowdered and streaming all about her shoulders, her chocolate on a small table at her side, and countless billets from admirers scattered on the sheet. In her hand she held a bouquet of white roses, with a card attached bearing in bold, sprawling characters the initials H.L. Perhaps it was the sight of those incriminating letters that roused Richard's anger. At all events, with a violence quite unlike his usual gentle politeness, he snatched the flowers from her hand and sent them whizzing into a corner. "'Let there be an end to all this folly,' he cried. Lavinia raised herself on one elbow, astonished. How, "'How dare you!' she gasped. "'It has come to that,' he answered. "'How dare I, your husband, try to control your actions in any way? I tell you, Lavinia, I have had enough of your antics, and I will no longer put up with them.' "'You! You! What in heaven's name ails you, Richard?' "'This!' I will not countenance that puppy's invasion of my house. He made a furious gesture towards the wilted bouquet. Neither will I permit you to make yourself the talk of London through him. I, I, I make myself the talk of London. How dare you? Oh, how dare you? I beg you will cease that foolishness. There is no question of my daring. How dare you disobey me? as you have been doing all this past week. She cowered away from him. Dicky, "'Tis very well to cry, Dicky, and to smile. But I have experienced that before. Sometimes I think you are utterly without heart, a selfish, vain, extravagant woman. The childish lips trembled. Lady Lavinia buried her face in the pillows, sobbing. Carstairs' face softened. "'I beg your pardon, my dear.' Mayhap that was unjust. And cruel, and cruel, and cruel. Forgive me. She twined white, satiny arms about his neck. 
"'You did not mean it?' "'No. I mean that I will not allow Lovelace to dangle after you, however.' She flung away from him. "'You have no right to speak like that. I knew Harry long before I ever set eyes on you.' He winced. "'You infer that he is more to you than I am.' "'No. Though you try to make me hate you, no. I love you best, but I will not send Harry away.' "'Not if I order it?' "'Order it? Order it? No, no, a thousand times no.' "'I do order it.' "'I refuse to listen to you.' "'By God, madam, you need a lesson,' he flamed. "'I am minded to take you back to Wincham this very day, and I promise you that an you do not obey me in this, to Wincham you shall go.' He stamped out of the room as he spoke, and she sank back amongst her pillows, white and trembling with fury. As soon as she was dressed, she flounced downstairs, bent on finishing the quarrel. But Carstairs had gone out some time since, and was not expected to return until late. For a moment Lavinia was furious, but the timely arrival of a box from her mantua-makers chased away the frowns and wreathed her face in smiles. Richard did not return until it was time to prepare for the rout, and on entering the house he went straight to his chamber, putting himself into the hands of his valet. He submitted to the delicate tinting of his fingernails, the sprinkling of his linen with rose-water, and the stenciling of his brows. He was arrayed in puce and gold, rings slipped on to his fingers, his legs coaxed into hose with marvellous clocks splashed on their sides, and a diamond buckle placed above the large black bow of his tie-wig. Then powdered, painted, and patched, he went slowly across to his wife's room. Lavinia, who had by now quite forgotten the morning's contretemps, greeted him with a smile. She sat before the mirror in her undergown, with a loose de chabelle thrown over her shoulders. The coiffure had departed, and her hair thickly powdered was dressed high above her head, over cushions, twisted into curls over her ears, and allowed to fall in more curls over her shoulders. On top of the creation were poised ostrich feathers, scarlet and white, and round her throat gleamed a great necklace of diamonds. The room was redolent of some heavy perfume. Discarded ribbons, laces, slippers, and gloves strode the floor. Over the back of a chair hung a brilliant scarlet domino, and tenderly laid out on the bed was her gown, a mass of white satin and brocade with full ruffles over the hips and quantities of foaming lace falling from the corsage and from the short sleeves. Beside it reposed her fan, her soft lace gloves, her mask, and her tiny reticule. Carstairs gingerly sat down on the extreme edge of a chair, and watched the maid tint his wife's already perfect cheeks. "'I shall break hearts to-night, shall I not?' she asked gaily over her shoulder. "'I do not doubt it,' he answered shortly. "'And you, Dicky?' She turned around to look at him. "'Puce! Tis not the colour I should have chosen.' but tis well enough. A new wig, Shelley? Ay. Her eyes questioned his coldness, and she suddenly remembered the events of the morning. So, he was sulky. Very well. Monsieur should see. Someone knocked at the door. The maid went to open it. Sir Douglas Favisham, Sir Gregory Markham, Miss Sole Chevere, and Captain Lovelace are below, my lady. A little devil prompted Lavinia. Ooh, la, la! So many! "'Well, I cannot see all, tis certain. Admit Sir Gregory and Captain Lovelace.' Louisa communicated this to the lackey, and shut the door. Richard bit his lip angrily. "'Are you sure I am not de troupe? he asked, savagely sarcastic. Lady Lavinia cast aside her de cheville, and stood up. "'Oh, tis no matter. I am ready for my gown, Louisa.' There came more knocking at the door, and this time it was Carstairs who rose to open it. There entered Markham, heavily handsome in crimson and gold, and Lovelace, his opposite, fair and delicately pretty in palest blue and silver. As usual, he wore his loose wig, and in it sparkled three sapphire pins. He made my lady a marvellous leg. "'I am prostrated by your beauty, fairest.' Sir Gregory was eyeing Lavinia's white slippers through his quizzing glass, "'Jeweled heels! Pwn my soul!' he drawled. She perrieted gracefully, her feet flashing as they caught the light. "'Was it not well thought on?' she demanded. "'But I must not waste time. The dress. 
Now, Markham, now, Harry, you will see the creation. Lovelace sat down on a chair, straddle-wise, his arms over the back, and his chin sunk in his hands. Markham leant against the garter robe and watched through his glass. When the dress was at last arranged, the suggested improvements in the matter of lace, ribbons, and the adjustment of a brooch thoroughly discussed, bracelets fixed on her arms and the flaming domino draped about her, it was full three-quarters of an hour later, and Carstairs was becoming impatient. It was not in his nature to join with the two men in making fulsome compliments, and their presence at the toilette filled him with annoyance. He hated that Lavinia should admit them, but it was the mode, and he knew he must bow the head under it. My lady was at last ready to start. Her gilded chair awaited her in the light of the flambeau at the door, and with great difficulty she managed to enter it, taking absurd pains that her silks should not crush, nor the nodding plumes of her huge headdress become disordered by unseemly contact with the roof. Then she found that she had left her fan in her room, and Lovelace and Markham must needs vie with one another in the fetching of it. While they wrangled wittily for the honour, Richard went quietly indoors and presently emerged with the painted chicken skin, just as Lovelace was preparing to ascend the steps. At last Lavinia was shut in, and the bearers picked up the poles. Off went the little cavalcade down the long square, the chair in the middle. Lovelace walked close beside it on the right, and Richard and Markham on the left. So they proceeded through the uneven streets, carefully picking their way through the dirtier parts, passing other chairs and pedestrians, all coming from various quarters into South Audley Street. They were remarkably silent, Markham from habitual laziness, Lovelace because he sensed Richard's antagonism, and Richard himself on account of his extremely worried state of mind. In fact, until they reached Curzon Street, no one spoke, and then it was only Markham who, glancing behind him at the shuttered windows of the great corner-house, casually remarked that Chesterfield was still at Wells. An absent assent came from Carstairs, and the conversation came to an end. In Clargus Street they were joined by Sir John Fortescue, an austere patrician, and although some years his senior, a close friend of Richard's. They fell behind the chair, and Fortescue took Richard's proffered arm. "'I did not see you at White's to-day, John. No, I had some business with my lawyer. I suppose you did not stumble across my poor brother?' "'Frank?' "'I did not. But why the poor—' Fortescue shrugged slightly. "'I think the lad is demented,' he said. He was to have made one of March's supper-party last night, but at four o'clock received a communication from heaven knows whom— which threw him into a state of unrest. What must he do but hurry off without a word of explanation? Since then I have not set eyes on him, but his man tells me he went to meet a friend. Damned unusual of him is all I have to say. Very strange. Do you expect to see him to-night? I should hope so. My dear Carstairs, who is the man walking by your lady's chair? Markham? The other. Lovelace. Lovelace? And who the devil is he? I cannot tell you, beyond a captain in the guards. That even is news to me. I saw him at Goose Trees the other night, and wondered. Somewhat of a rake hell, I surmise. I dare say I do not like him. They were entering the gates of Devonshire House now, and had to part company, for the crush was so great that it was almost impossible to keep together. Carstairs stayed by Lavinia's chair, and the other men melted away into the crowd. Chairs jostled one another in the effort to get to the door. Town coaches rolled up, and having let down their fair burdens, passed out again slowly, pushing through the throng. When the Carstairs chair at last drew near the house, it was quite a quarter of an hour later. The ballroom was already full, and a blaze of riotous colour. Lavinia was almost immediately borne off by an infatuated youth, for whom she cherished a motherly affection, that would have caused the unfortunate to tear his elegant locks, had he known it. Richard distinguished Lord Andrew Belmanoir, one of a group of bucks gathered about the newest beauty, Miss Gunning, who, with her sister Elizabeth, had taken fashionable London by storm. Andrew wore a mask, but he was quite unmistakable by his length of limb and carelessly rakish appearance. Wilding, across the room, beckoned to Richard, and on his approach dragged him to the card-room to play at Lansquinet with March. Selwyn and himself. Carstairs found the Earl in great good humour, 
do so Selwyn remarked, to the finding of an opera singer even more lovely than the last. From Lane's Quinette, they very soon passed to Dice and Betting, with others who strolled up to the table. Then Carstairs excused himself and went back to the ballroom. He presently found himself by the side of one Isabella Fanshawe, a sprightly widow, greatly famed for her wittiness and good looks. Carstairs had met her but once before, and was now rather surprised that she motioned him to her side, patting the couch with an inviting, much beringed hand. "'Come, and sit by me, Mr. Carstairs. I have wanted to speak with you this long time.' She lowered her mask as she spoke, and closely scrutinized his face with her bright, humorous eyes. "'Why, madam, I am flattered,' bowed Richard. She cut him short. "'I am not in the mood for compliments, sir, nor am I desirous of making or hearing clever speeches. You are worrying me.' Richard sat down, intrigued and attracted by this downright little woman. "'I, madam? You, sir. That is, your face worries me.' Seeing his surprise, she laughed, fanning herself. <laughs> "'Tis comely enough, I grant you. I mean there is such a strong likeness to a friend of mine.' Richard smiled politely and relieved her of the fan. "'Indeed, madam.' "'Yes. I knew this other gentleman in Vienna three years ago. I should judge him younger than you, I think. His eyes were blue, but very similar to yours. His nose was almost identical with yours, but the mouth, n no, yet the whole expression—' She broke off, noticing her companion's sudden pallor. "'But you are unwell, sir.' "'No, madam, no. What was your friend's name?' "'Ferndale,' she answered. "'Anthony Ferndale.' The fan stopped its swaying for a moment. "'Ah,' said Richard, "'do you know him?' she inquired eagerly. "'Many years ago, madam, I was acquainted with him. "'Can you tell me, was he in good spirits when you last saw him?' She pursed her lips thoughtfully. "'If you mean, was he gay, was he witty, yes. "'But sometimes I thought, Mr. Carstairs, when he was silent, his eyes were so sad. "'Indeed, I do not know why I tell you this.' "'You may be sure, madam, your confidence is safe with me. "'I had a great regard for this gentleman.' "'He opened and shut her fan as he spoke, fidgeting with the slender sticks. "'You too were interested in him, madam.' "'I do not think ever any one knew him and was not, sir. "'It was something in his manner, his personality, I cannot explain, "'that endeared him to one, and he once aided me when I was in difficulties.' Richard, remembering scraps of gossip concerning the widow's past, merely bowed his head. She was silent for a time, staring down at her hands, but presently she looked up, smiling, and took her fan away from him. "'I cannot abide a fidget, sir,' she told him. "'And I see Lord Fotheringham approaching. I am promised to him this dance.' She rose, but Richard detained her. "'Mrs. Fanshawe, will you permit me to call upon you? I would hear more of your friend.' "'You may have think it strange, but—' "'No,' she answered. "'I do not. "'Certainly call upon me, sir. "'I lodge in Mount Street with my sister, number sixteen. "'I protest, madam, you are too good. "'Again, no, I have told you. "'I like a man to talk as a man, and not as an affected woman. "'I shall be pleased to welcome you.' "'She curtsied and went away on the Viscount's arm. "'At the same moment a voice at Richard's elbow drawled. "'Do I see you at the vivacious widow's feet, my good Dick?' Carstairs turned to face his brother-in-law, Colonel Belmanoir. "'Is not all London?' he smiled. "'Oh, no, not since the beautiful Gunnings arrived. But I admit she is a dainty piece. And Lavinia? Will she break her heart, I wonder?' He laughed beneath his breath as he saw Richard's eyes flash. "'I trust not,' replied Carstairs. "'Are you all here tonight? "'Our illustrious head is absent, I believe. "'Andrew is flirting with the Fletcher girl in the blue salon. "'I am here, and Lavinia is amusing herself with Lovelace. "'Yes, Richard, Lovelace. "'Be careful.' "'With another sneering laugh he walked on, "'bowing to Elizabeth Gunning, "'who passed by on the arm of her partner, "'His Grace of Hamilton, most palpably a pre. "'At that moment... Two late-comers entered the room and made their way towards their hostess, who appeared delighted to see them, especially the taller of the two, 
whose hand she slapped with good-humoured raillery. The shorter gentleman wore no mask, and the colonel recognised Frank Fortescue. His eyes travelled to the other, who, unlike most of the men who only held their masks, had fastened his across his eyes, and they widened in surprise. The purple domino, worn carelessly open, revealed black satin encrusted with silver and diamonds. The natural hair was raven black. The nostrils were pinched, and the lips thin. "'The devil!' ejaculated Robert, and strolled over to him. Fortescue walked away when he saw who approached, and his grace of Andover turned slowly towards his brother. "'I rather thought you were in Paris,' yawned the colonel. "'I am always sorry to disillusion you,' bowed his grace. "'Not at all. I am transported with joy at seeing you, as is Lavinia, it appears.' Lady Lavinia, on recognising his grace, had dropped her partner's hand and fled incontinent towards him. "'You! Tracy!' she clasped delighted hands on his arm. "'This is very touching,' sneered Robert. "'It only needs Andrew to complete the happy reunion. Pray excuse me.' "'With pleasure,' replied the Duke gently, and bowed as if to a stranger. "'He grows tedious,' he remarked, as soon as the Colonel was out of earshot. "'Oh, Bob, I take no account of him. But, Tracy, how is it you have come to-day? I thought—' "'My dear Lavinia, do I wear an air of mystery? I imagined you knew I was promised to Dolly Cavendish to-night. "'Yes, but—oh, what matters it? I am so charmed to see you again, dear.' "'You flatter me, Lavinia. "'And now that you have come, I want to hear why you ever went. Tracy, take me into the room behind us. I know it is empty.' "'Very well, child, as you will.' He held back the curtain for her, and followed her into the deserted chamber. "'You want to know why I went?' he began, seating himself at her side. "'I counsel you, my dear, to cast your mind back to the spring, at Bath.' "'Your affair, of course. So the lady proved unkind?' "'No, but I bungled it.' "'You! Tell me at once, at once!' His grace stretched out his leg, and surveyed his shoe-buckle through half-closed lids. "'I had arranged everything,' he said, "'and all would have been well, but for an interfering young jackanapes who chanced along the track and saw fit to espouse Madame Diana's cause. He paused. He tripped me up by some trick, and then gave it "'Who was it? How should I know? At first he seemed familiar. At all events, he knew me. He may be dead by now. I hope he is.' "'Gracious! Did you wound him?' I managed to fire at him, but he was too quick, and the bullet took him in the shoulder. It may, however, have been mortal. And so you went to Paris? I to forget her. And have you forgotten? I have not. She is never out of my thoughts. I plan again. His sister sighed. She is then more beautiful than the Pompadour? She asked meaningly. Tracy turned his head. The Pompadour? I, we heard you contrive to amuse yourself in a pretty fashion, Tracy. Really? I had no idea people were so interested in my affairs. But amuse is an apt word. Ah, you were not then a pre? I, was that low-born coquette? My dear Lavinia. She laughed at his haughty tone. You've not always been so nice, Tracy. But what of your Diana? And you are so infatuated, you had best wed her. Why, so I think. Lady Lavinia gasped. Tracy, you do not mean it. Goodness me, but a marriage. Why not, Lavinia? Oh, a respectable man, forsooth. And how long will the passion last? I cannot be expected to foretell that, surely. I hope for ever. And you'll tie yourself up for the sake of one chit? Lord! I can conceive of a worse fate for a man. Can you? Well, tell me more. Tis monstrous exciting. Do you intend to court her? At this stage of the proceedings? That was somewhat tactless, my dear. I must abduct her. But I must be more careful. Once I have her— I can propitiate Papa. Tracy, 
"'Tis the maddest scheme ever I heard. What will the others say? Do you really suppose I care? No, I suppose not. Oh, will not Bob be furious, though? It were almost worth while just for the sake of foiling him. He would so like to succeed me, but I really do not think he must. His elbow was on his knee, his chin in his hand, and a peculiar smile on his lips. Can you imagine him stepping into my ducal shoes, Lavinia? Very easily, she cried. Oh, yes, yes, Tracy. Marry the girl. If she will. Why, tis not like you to underrate your persuasive powers. His grace's thin nostrils wrinkled up in a curious grimace. I believe one cannot force a girl to the altar, he said. Unless she is a fool, she'll have you. Her parent would be influenced by my dukedom, but she, no. Not even if she knew it. Does she not know? Certainly not. I am Mr. Everard. How wise of you, Tracy. So you've not to fear. Fear? He snapped his fingers. I? The heavy curtain swung noiselessly aside. Richard Carstairs stood in the opening. Tracy turned his head and scrutinized him languidly. Then he put up his hand and removed his mask. Is it possible the husband scented an intrigue? It seems I am doomed to disappoint to-night. Lavinia, smarting from her morning's wrongs, laughed savagely. More probable he mistook me for someone else, she snapped. Richard bowed his hand on the curtain. He had shown no surprise at seeing the Duke. Far more probable, my dear. I thought you Lady Charles would. Pray give me leave. He was gone on the word. Tracy replaced his mask, chuckling. <laughs> Honest Dick grows cold, eh? But what a snub, Lavinia. Her little hand clenched. Oh, how dare he! How dare he insult me so! My dear sister, in all justice to him, you must admit the boot was rather on the other leg. Oh, I know. I know. But he is so provoking, so jealous, so unreasonable. Jealous? And why? With an impatient twitch at her petticoat, she made answer, not looking at him. Oh, I do not know, nor he. Take me back to the ballroom. Certainly, my dear. He rose and led her out. I shall do myself the honour of waiting on you to-morrow. Yes? How delightful twill be. Come to dine, Tracy. Richard is promised to the Fortescues. In that case, I have much pleasure in accepting your invitation. In heaven's name, who was this? Lovelace was bearing down upon them. Lavinia, I have been seeking you everywhere. Ah, your servant, sir. He bowed to his grace and took Lavinia's hand. Oh, oh, Harold, you remember Tracy? She said nervously. Tracy, I did not know you masked. I saw you last in Paris. Really? I regret I was not aware of your presence. It is a good many years since I had the honour of seeing you. Five, nodded Lovelace, and sent a smiling, amorous glance at Lavinia. Exactly, bowed his grace. You have, I perceive, renewed your acquaintance with my sister. When they were gone, he caressed his chin thoughtfully. Lovelace, and Richard is so jealous, so unreasonable. Now I do hope Lavinia will do nothing indiscreet. Yes, Frank, I was talking to myself, a bad habit. Fortescue, who had come up behind him, took his arm. A sign of lunacy, my dear. Jim Cavendish demands you. Does he? May I ask why? He is in the card room. There is some bet on, I believe. In that case, I shall have to go. You had best accompany me, Frank. Very well. You have seen Lady Lavinia. Beneath the mask, his grace's eyes narrowed. I have seen Lavinia. Also, I have seen an old friend. Lovelace, by name. The captain with the full-bottomed wig. Your friend, you say. Did I say so? I should correct myself. A friend of my sister's. Indeed. Yes, I believe I have seen him in her company. 
Tracy smiled enigmatically. I dare say. And what of you, Tracy? Well, what of me? You told me this morning that you had at last fallen in love. Is it true? You are honestly in love. Honestly? How do I know? I only know that I have felt this passion for four months, and now it is stronger than ever. It sounds like love. Then, and she is a good woman, I hope she will consent to take you, such as you are, and make of you such as she can. Now that is very neat, Frank. I congratulate you. Of course she will take me. As to the rest, I think not. Darren Allen's Tracy. But in that is the tone you take with her, she'll have none of you. I have never found it unsuccessful. With your common trollops, no. But if your Diana is a lady, she will dispatch you about your business. Woo her, man. Forget your own damned importance, for I think you will need to humble yourself to the dust if all that you tell me has passed between you is true. They had paused outside the card-room, a curtain shut it off from the ballroom, and with his hand on it, Tracy stared arrogantly down at his friend. "'Humble myself! For gad, you must be mad! Be like I am, but I tell you, Tracy, that if your passion is love, tis a strange one that puts yourself first. I would not give the snap of a finger for it. You want this girl, not for her happiness, but for your own pleasure. That is not the love I once told you would save you from yourself. When it comes, you will count yourself as not. You will realize your own insignificance, and, above all, be ready to make any sacrifice for her sake, yes, even to the point of losing her. His grace's lips sneered. Your eloquence is marvellous, he remarked. I have not been so amused since I left Paris. End of chapter 19 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona September 2011Chapter 20 of The Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter 20. His Grace of Andover Takes a Hand in the Game. When the Duke of Andover dined next day at Grosvenor Square, he contrived, by subtle means, to make his sister feel inexplicably ill at ease. He let fall pleasant little remarks concerning her friendship with Captain Lovelace, in which she read disapproval and a sinister warning. She was afraid of him, as she was not of her husband, and she knew that if he ever guessed at the depths of her affection for the old flame, he would take very effective measures towards stopping her intercourse with him. It was then entirely owing to his return that she told Lovelace that he must not so palpably adore her, neither must he visit her so frequently. They were both in her boudoir at the time, one morning, and no doubt Lavinia looked very lovely and very tempting in her wrapper, with her golden curls free from powder, and loosely dressed beneath her escalloped lace ruffle. At all events, Lovelace abandoned his daintily bantering pose and seized her in his arms, nearly smothering her with fierce, passionate caresses. Her ladyship struggled, gave a faint shriek, and started to cry. As his kisses seemed to aggravate her tears, he picked her up, and carrying her to a chair, lowered her gently into it. Then, having first dusted the floor with his handkerchief, he knelt down beside her and possessed himself of both her hands. "'Lavinia, goddess, I adore you!' Bethinking herself that tears were ruinous to her complexion, Lady Lavinia pulled her hands away and dabbed at her eyes. "'Oh, Harold!' she reproached him. "'I have offended you, wretch that I am.' "'Oh, no, no!' Lady Lavinia gave him her hand again. "'But twas wicked of you, Harry. You must never, never do it again.' His arm crept round her waist. "'But I love you, sweetheart.' "'Oh, oh, think of Dicky. He released her at that, and sprang to his feet. "'Why should I think of him? "'Tis of you and myself, I think. Only a week ago you vowed he was unkind.' "'You are monstrous wicked to remind me of that. "'We were both cross, and then we were both sorry. "'I am very fond of poor Dicky. "'Fond of him? Ay, so you may be. "'But you do not love him. 
not as a woman loves a man. Do you? Harold! Of course you do not. You used to love me. No, do not shake your head. Tis true. You would have married me had it not been for Tracy. Oh, Harry, how can you say so? What had he to do with it? What, indeed? Whose fault was it that I was time after time refused admittance to Dandover? Whose fault was it that you were induced to marry Carstairs? Not Tracy's. "'Twas my own wish. "'Fostered by his influence? "'Oh, no. "'You never loved Carstairs. "'I did. "'I do. "'You may think so, but I know better. "'Why, he is not even suited to you. "'You were made for life and pleasure and hazard. "'With me you would have had all that. "'With him.' "'She had risen to her feet and drawn nearer to him, "'her eyes sparkling.' but now she covered her ears with her hands and stamped pettishly. "'I will not listen. I will not. I tell you. Oh, you are unkind to plague me so.' Lovelace took her into his arms once more, and drawing down her hands, kissed her again and again. She resisted, trying to thrust him off, but she was crushed against him, and he would have kissed her again had not there come an interruption. A knock fell on the door, and the footman announced, "'His Grace of Andover, my lady.' The guilty pair sprang apart in the nick of time, she fiery red, he pale but composed. His grace stood in the doorway, his quizzing glass raised inquiringly. His eyes went swiftly from one to the other, and widened. He bowed elaborately. "'My dear Lavinia, Captain Lovelace, you're very obedient.' Lovelace returned the bow with much flourish. "'Your grace.' "'Dear me, Tracy,' cried Lavinia, advancing. What an unexpected visit! I trust I have not arrived at an inopportune moment, my dear. Oh, no, no, she assured him. I am quite charmed to see you, but at such an early hour, I confess, it quite astonishes me. She brought him to a chair, chattering like a child, and so innocent was his expression, so smiling his attitude towards the captain, that she imagined that he suspected nothing, and had not noticed her blushes. It was only when Lovelace had departed that she was undeceived. Then, when his grace moved to a chair opposite her, she saw that he was frowning slightly. "'You—you are put out over something, Tracy?' she asked nervously. The frown deepened. "'No, I am not put out. I merely anticipate the sensation.' "'I—I do not understand. What mean you?' "'At present, nothing.' "'Tracy—' "'Please do not be mysterious. Are you like to be put out?' "'I trust not, Lavinia.' "'But what annoys you?' Instead of answering, he put a question. "'I hope you amused yourself well last night, my dear sister.' She flushed. Last night had been Lady Davenant's masquerade to which Lord Robert had conducted her. She had danced almost exclusively with Lovelace the whole evening but as they were both masked, she was rather surprised at the question. "'I enjoyed myself quite tolerably, thank you. You were there?' "'No, Lavinia, I was not there.' "'Then how do you know?' She stopped, in confusion, biting her lips. For an instant she caught a glimpse of his eyes, piercing and cold. "'How do I know?' smoothly finished his grace. "'One hears things, Lavinia, also.' He glanced round the room. "'One sees things.' "'I—I I do not understand you,' she shot out, twisting the lace of her gown with restless and easy fingers. "'No. Must I then be more explicit?' "'Yes. Yes, I should be glad.' "'Then let me beg of you, my dear Lavinia, that you will commit no indiscretion.' Her cheeks flamed. "'You mean—' "'I mean that you have grown too friendly with Harold Lovelace.' "'What of it?' His Grace put up his eyeglass, faintly astonished. "'What of it? Pray think a moment, Lavinia.' "'Tis not likely that I shall be the one to disgrace the name, Tracy.' "'I sincerely hope not. I give you my word I should do all in my power to prevent any foolhardy action on your part. Pray do not forget it.' She sat silent, biting her lips. "'It is, my child, unwise to play with fire.' Sooner or later one gets burnt. 
and remember that your gallant captain is not one half of Richard's wealth. Up she sprang, kicking her skirts as she always did when angered. Money, money, always money, she cried. I do not care one rap for it, and Richard is not wealthy. Richard is heir to wealth, replied his grace calmly. And even in you are so impervious to its charms. I, my dear, am not. Richard is extremely useful to me. I beg you will not leave him for any such mad rake as Lovelace, who would be faithful to you for perhaps three months, certainly not longer. Tracy, I will not have you speak to me like this. How dare you insult me so? I have given you no cause. I did not say I had any desire to run away with him, and he would be faithful to me. He has been faithful all these years. His grace smiled provokingly. My dear. I know. There have been episodes, indiscretions. Do you think I count him the worse for that? Evidently not. There has never been another serious love with him. I hate you. You are over-free with your emotions, my dear. So you do indeed contemplate an elopement? No, 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 I do not. I am fond of Dicky. Dear me. Of course I shall not leave him. Why, then? I am satisfied, he answered and rose to his feet. I shall look to see Captain Lovelace more out of your company. He picked up his hat and cane and stood directly in front of her. One dead white hand on which blazed a great ruby seal ring took her little pointed chin in a firm clasp and tilted her head up until she was forced to meet his eyes. They held hers inexorably scorchingly. You understand me? he asked harshly. Lavinia's eyes filled with tears, and her soft underlip trembled. Yes, she fluttered, and gave a tiny sob. Oh, yes, Tracy. The eyes lost something of their menacing gleam, and he smiled, for once without a sneer, and releasing her chin, patted her cheek indulgently. Bear in mind, child, that I am fifteen years your senior, and I have more worldly wisdom in my little finger than you have in the whole of your composition. I do not wish to witness your ruin. The tears brimmed over, and she caught his handkerchief from him, dabbing at her eyes with one heavily laced corner. You do love me, Tracy? In the recesses of my mind, I believe I cherish some affection for you, he replied coolly, rescuing his handkerchief. I used to clash you with your deplorable brothers, but I think perhaps I was wrong. She gave an hysterical laugh. <laughs> Tracy! How can you be so disagreeable? Lord, but I pity Diana as she marries you. To her surprise, he flushed a little. Diana, and she marries me, will have all that her heart could desire. He answered stiffly and took his leave. Once outside in the square, he looked for a sedan, and not seeing one, walked away towards Audley Street. He went quickly, but his progress was somewhat retarded by two ladies, who, passing in their chairs down the street, perceived him and beckoned him to their sides. Escaping presently from them, he turned into Curzon Street, and from thence down Half Moon Street, where he literally fell into the arms of Tom Wilding, who had much to say on the subject of March's last bet with Edgecombe. His grace affected interest, politely declined Wilding's proffered escort, and hurried down into Piccadilly, walking eastwards towards St. James Square, where was the Andover townhouse. He was fated to be again detained, for as he walked along Arlington Street, Mr. Walpole was on the point of descending the steps of Number 5. He also had much to say to his grace. He had no idea Belmanoir had returned from Paris. A week ago he had arrived. Well, he, Walpole, had been out of town all the week, at Twickenham. He hoped Bell would honour him with his company at the small card party he was giving there on Thursday. George was coming, and Dick Edgecombe. He had asked March and Gilly Williams, but the Lord knew whether both would be induced to appear. Bell had heard of Gilly's absurd jealousy. Wilding was promised, and Markham's several other answers he was awaiting. Andover accepted gracefully, and parted from Walpole. He made the rest of his journey in peace, and on arriving at his house, went straight to the library where sat a sleek, eminently respectable-looking individual, dressed like a groom. He stood up as his grace entered and bowed. Belmanois nodded shortly and sat down at his desk. "'I have work for you, Harper.' "'Yes, sir, your grace, I should say. "'Do you know Sussex?' "'Well, your grace, I don't know as how—' "'Do you know Sussex?' 
"'No, Your Grace. Uh, yes, Your Grace. I, I should say, not well, Your Grace. "'Have you heard of a place called Little Lean? "'No, sir. Uh, Your Grace. "'Midhurst? Oh, yes, Your Grace. Good. "'Little Dean is seven miles west of it. "'You will find that out. "'Also an inn called, I think, the Pointing Finger. "'There you will lodge.' "'Yes, Your Grace, certainly. "'At a very little distance from there is a house, "'Horton House, where lives a certain Mr. Bullet, "'with his sister and daughter. "'You are to watch the comings and goings of these people "'with the utmost care. "'Eventually you will become groom to Mr. Bullet. But, "'But, Your Grace,' feebly protested the astonished Harper, "'you will approach their present groom.' and you will insinuate that i andover am in need of a second groom you will tell them that i pay handsomely treble what mr bullet gives him if i know human nature he will apply for the post you then step in if mr bullet asks for some recommendation you are to refer him to sir hugh grandison white's chocolate house st james street when you are engaged i will send further instructions the man gaped shut his mouth and gaped again do you fully understand me asked belmanoir calmly uh, uh, yes your grace repeat what i have said then harper stumbled through it and mopped his brow unhappily very well in addition i pay you twice as much as mr bullet gives you and at the end if you serve me well fifty guineas are you satisfied harper brightened considerably yes your grace "'Thank you, sir.' Tracy laid twenty guineas before him. "'That is for your expenses. Remember this. The sooner the thing is done, the more certain are your fifty guineas. That is all. Have you any questions to ask?' Harper cudgelled his still, dazed brain, and finding none, shook his head. "'No, your grace. Then you may go.' The man bowed himself out, clutching his guineas. He was comparatively a newcomer in his grace's service, and he was by no means accustomed to the duke's lightning method of conducting his affairs. He was not sure that he quite appreciated it, but fifty guineas were fifty guineas. End of chapter 20 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, September 2011
No. If one attempted to draw his confidence, he became a polite iceberg. Nevertheless, madam, please tell me all that you know. It will not take long, I fear. I met him in forty-eight, at Vienna, in the Prater, where I was walking with my husband, who had come to Vienna for his health. I chanced to let fall my reticule when Sir Anthony was passing us, and he picked it up, speaking the most execrable German. She smiled a little at the remembrance. Mr. Fanshawe, who had the greatest dislike for all foreigners, was overjoyed to hear the English accent. He induced Sir Anthony to continue his walk with us, and afterwards he called at our lodgings. I think he, too, was glad to meet fellow countrymen, for he came often and once when I had been talking with him for some time he let fall, what shall I say, his reserve, his guard, and told me that he had scarcely spoken his own language for four years. Afterwards he seemed to regret having said even that much, and turned the subject. She paused and looked up to see if her auditor was listening. Yes, yes, urged Richard, and then? I do not remember. He came, as I said, often, mostly to talk to my husband, who was a great invalid, but sometimes to see me. He would hardly ever speak of England. I think he did not trust himself. He never mentioned any relations, or any English friends, and when I spoke of home, he would shut his mouth very tightly, and look terribly sad. I saw that for some reason the subject pained him, so I never spoke of it if I could help it. He was a most entertaining companion, Mr. Carstairs, he used to tell my husband tales that made him laugh, as I had not heard him laugh for months. He was very lively, very witty, and almost finickingly well-dressed, but what his occupation was I could not quite ascertain. He said he was a gentleman of leisure, but I do not think he was at all wealthy. He frequented all the gaming-houses, and I heard tales of his marvellous luck. So one day I taxed him with it, and he laughed and said he lived by chance. He meant dice. Yet I know, for I once had a conversation with his servant, that his purse was at times very, very slender. The time he aided you, Mrs. Fanshawe? When was that? She flushed. That was a few months after we first met him. I was foolish. My married life was not very happy, and I was, or rather I fancied myself in love, with an Austrian nobleman who, who, well, sir, Suffice it that I consented to dine with him one evening. I found then that he was not the gallant homme I had thought him, but something quite different. I do not know what I should have done had not Sir Anthony arrived. He did arrive then? Yes. You see, he knew that this Austrian had asked me to dine. I told him, and he counselled me to refuse. But I, well, sir, I have told you, I was very young and very foolish. I would not listen. When he called at our house and found that I was out, he at once guessed where I had gone, and he followed me to the Count's house, gave an Austrian name, and was announced, just as the Count tried to— tried to— kiss me. I think I shall never forget the relief of that moment. He was so safe and so English. The Count was furious, and at first I thought he would have his lackey throw Anthony out— but when he heard all that Anthony had to say, he realised that it was useless to try to detain me, and I was taken home. Anthony was very kind. He did not scold, neither had he told my husband. Two days after, he and the Count fought a duel, and the Count was wounded in the lung. That was all. But it made me very grateful to him, and interested in his affairs. Mr. Fanshawe left Vienna a few weeks after that, and I have never seen my Prue Chevalier since. She sighed and looked steadily across at Carstairs. And you, you are so like him. You think so, madam, was all I could find to say. I do, sir, and something more, which perhaps you will deem an impertinence. Is Anthony your brother? The suddenness of the attack threw Carstairs off his guard. He went white. Madam! Please! Be not afraid that mine is the proverbial woman's tongue, sir. It does not run away with me, I assure you. When I saw you the other night for the first time, I was struck by the resemblance, and I asked my partner, Mr. Stapley, who you were. He told me, and much more beside, which I was not at the time desirous of hearing. 
trust Will Stapley, exclaimed Richard, and mentally cursed the amiable gossip-monger. Among other things, he told me of your elder brother, who, who, in fact, he told me the whole story. Of course, my mind instantly leapt to my poor Sir Anthony, despite that in appearance he is younger than you. Was I right? Richard rose to his feet and walked away to the window, standing with his back to her. I. I was sure of it, she nodded. So that was why he would not speak of England. Poor boy. Richard's soul writhed under the lash of her pity. So he will always be outcast, she continued, alone, unhappy, without friends. No, he cried, turning. For God, no, madam. Will society, cruel, hard society, receive him, then? she asked. "'Society will, one day, receive him, Mrs. Fanshawe. You will see.' "'I long for that day,' she sighed. "'I wish I had it in my power to help him, to repay in part the debt I owe him.' At that he lifted his head. "'My brother, madam, would count it not a debt, but an honour. he answered proudly. "'Yes,' she smiled. "'You are like him. When you speak like that—' You might almost be he. He is worth a thousand of me, Mrs. Fanshawe, he replied vehemently, and broke off, staring down at the table. And his name? she asked softly. John Anthony St. Irvine Delaney Carstairs, he said, Earl of Wincham. So the Anthony was real. I am so glad, for he would always be Anthony to me. There was a long silence, broken at last by the lady. "'I fear I have made you sad, Mr. Carstairs. You will drink a dish of Bohea with me, before you go, and we will not speak of this again.' "'You are very good, madam. Believe me. I am grateful to you for telling me all that you have. I beg you will allow me to wait on you again ere long. I shall be honoured, sir. I am nearly always at home to my friends.' Her sister entered the room soon after and private conversation came to an end. Carstairs lay awake long that night, hearing the hours toll by and the owls screech in the square. The widow's words had sunk deep into his ever-uneasy conscience, and he could not sleep for the thought of John, alone, unhappy, without friends. Time after time had he argued this question with himself, John or Lavinia. He fell to wondering where his brother now was, whether he was still roaming the south country a highwayman. No one would ever know how he, Richard, dreaded each fresh capture made by the military. Every time he expected John to be among the prisoners, and he visited Newgate so often that his friends twitted him on it, vowing he had Selwyn's love of horrors. He would argue that the matter rested in John's own hands. If he were minded to come back to society, he would do so, but deep within himself he knew that such a decision was unworthy of one even so debased as was he. Then his mind went to Lavinia, who alternately enchanted and exasperated him. Only a week ago she had defied him openly in the matter of her friendship with Lovelace, yet had she not afterwards apologized and thrust the captain aside for his sake. She was so sweetly naughty, so childishly unreasonable. Selfish? Yes. He supposed so, but he loved her, loved her so greatly that it were a pleasure to him to die for her sake. Yet John, John was his brother, the adored elder brother, and by obeying Lavinia he was wronging him, hurting him. If only Lavinia would get sent to the truth being told, it always came back to that point. If only she would consent, and she never would. She insisted that having married her under false pretenses, he had no right to disgrace her now. She was right, he knew, but he wished she could be for once unselfish. So he worried on through the night, tossing to and fro in his great bed, a weight on his mind, a ceaseless ache in his heart. Towards dawn he fell asleep, and did not wake again until his chocolate was brought to him. Bitterly he reflected that at least John had no conscience to prey upon him. He did not fall asleep with his brain seething with conflicting arguments, and awake with the decision as far off as ever. Today his head ached unbearably, and he stayed in bed for some time, contemplating the grey morning. A fog hung over the square, and through it the trees, with their withered autumn leaves, loomed dismally before the windows. 
There was something infinitely depressing about the dull outlook, and presently he rose and allowed his valet to dress him, not able to stand the inaction any longer. His headache was better by the time he had visited his wife in her room and listened to her enthusiastic account of last night's rout, and going out into the square, he called a chair, ordering the men to carry him to White's, where he intended to write two letters. Somehow, Wincham House was too poignantly full of memories of John to-day, and he was thankful to be out of it. White's was crowded even at that hour of the morning, and the noise seemed to cut through his head. Men hailed him from all sides, offering him bets. Someone tried to tell him some piece of scandal. They would not let him alone, and at last his jagged nerves would no longer support it, and he left the house to go further down the street to his other club, the Cocoa Tree, which he hoped to find less rowdy. It was fuller than he expected, but many of the men had come as he had, to write letters and to be quiet. Very little gaming was as yet in swing. Richard wrote steadily for perhaps an hour, and sealed his last letter preparatory to leaving. As he affixed the wafer, he was conscious of a stir behind him, and heard exclamations of, "'Where in thunder did you spring from? Gad, tis an age since I've seen you. Lord, tis O'Hara!' Then came the soft Irish voice in answer, and he slewed round in his chair to face them all. Miles O'Hara was the centre of a little group of interested and welcoming club men explaining his arrival. "'Sure, I was in town on the matter of business, and I thought I must come to see the club to see ye all while I was here, for it is not often I get the chance.' Richard rose, gathering up his letters, and stared across at this man who had been Jack's greatest friend. He took a step towards him. As he did so, O'Hara turned and caught sight of him. Richard was about to hail him when he suddenly noticed the change in his expression. The good humour died out of the Irishman's eyes, and left them hard and scornful. His pleasant mouth curved into a disdainful line. Carstairs still stood, one hand on the back of a chair, his eyes riveted to O'Hara's face, reading all the reproach, the red-hot anger that Miles was trying to convey to him. O'Hara achieved a sneer, and turned his shoulder, continuing to address his friends. Richard's head swam. O'Hara was ignoring him, would not speak to him. O'Hara knew the truth. He walked blindly to the door and groped for the handle. O'Hara knew. He was in the passage, on the front steps, in the road, shuddering. O'Hara knew. And he had looked at him as if, as if, again he shuddered, and seeing an empty chair, hailed it, bidding the men carry him to Grosvenor Square. O'Hara despised him reproached him. Then Jack was in trouble. He had seen him and learnt the truth. God, but his brain was reeling. End of chapter 21 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, September 2011of the Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter 22. Developments. After the encounter with O'Hara, Whatever peace of mind Richard had had, left him. He knew not a moment's quiet, all day, and sometimes all night. His brain worried round and round the everlasting question, John or Lavinia. He had quite decided that it must be either the one or the other. The idea that he might conceivably retain his wife and confess the truth never occurred to him. So often had Lavinia assured him that he had no right to expect her to share his disgrace, that now he believed it. He thought that she would elope with Lovelace, whom his tortured mind decided she really loved. Any attempt to frustrate such an action would, he supposed wretchedly, be the essence of selfishness. Of course he was not himself, and his brain was not working normally or rationally. Had he but known it, he was mentally ill, and if Lavinia had thought to examine him closely, she could not have failed to observe the fever spots on each cheek the unnaturally bright eyes, and the dark rings encircling them. Richard wore the look of one goaded beyond endurance, and utterly tired and overwrought. 
as he told Mrs. Fanshawe when she exclaimed at his appearance. He could not rest. He must always be moving, thinking. She saw that he was not entirely himself, and counseled him to consult a doctor. His half-angry repudiation of all illness did not surprise her, but she was considerably startled when, in answer to her pleading that he should have a care for himself, he vehemently said, "'If I could die, I should be glad.' She wondered what his wife was about, not to see his condition, and wished that she might do something. But she was not acquainted with Lady Lavinia, and she felt it would be a piece of gross presumption on her part to speak to her of Richard. If she had thought his malady to be physical, she reflected, she might venture a word, but as she perceived it to be mental, she could only hope that it would pass in time, and that he would recover from his run-down condition. Lady Lavinia was pursuing her butterfly existence, heeding nothing but her own pleasure, bent on enjoying herself. She succeeded very well, on the whole, but she could not help wishing that Dicky were a little more cheerful and wishful to join in her gaiety. Of late he was worse than ever, and although he supplied her wants uncomplainingly, she would almost rather he had refused her and shown a little life, than give way to her with his dreadful apathy. Lovelace was out of town for a week, and Lavinia was surprised to find how little she missed him. To be sure, playing with fire was very pleasant, but when it was removed out of her reach it really made no odds. She missed Harry's adulation and his passionate love-making for she was one of those women who must always have admiration and excitement, but she was not made miserable by his absence. She continued to flutter around to all the entertainments of the season with one or other of her brothers, and when Lovelace returned he was disturbed by her casual welcome. However, she was undoubtedly pleased to see him, and soon fell more or less under his spell, allowing him to be by her side when Tracy was not near, and to charm her ears with compliments and gallantry. To do him justice, Captain Harold was really in love with her, and was quite ready to relinquish his commission if only she would run away with him. He had private means of his own, and promised her that her every whim should be satisfied. But Lavinia scolded him, and shook her head. Apart from any ulterior consideration, Richard was, after all, her husband. He, too, loved her, and she was very, very fond of him, although she did plague him dreadfully. Lovelace assured her that her husband did not love her nearly as much as he, and when she smiled her disbelief, lost his temper and cried that all the town knew Carstairs to be at Mrs. Fanshawe's feet. Lavinia stiffened. "'Harold! I am only surprised that you have been blind to it,' he continued. "'Where do you think he goes every day for so long? Whites? No. To number 16 Mount Street.' Stapley called there and meant him another day. Lady Davenant saw him with her. Wilding has also met him at her house. He spends nearly every afternoon with her. Lavinia was a Belmanoir, and she had all the Belmanoir pride. Rising to her feet, she drew her cloak about her with her most queenly air. "'You forget yourself, Harold,' she said haughtily. "'Never dare to speak to me of my husband again in that tone. You may take me at once to my brother.' He was very penitent, wording his apology most cleverly, smoothing her ruffled plumage, withdrawing his words, but at the same time contriving to leave their sting behind. She forgave him, yes, but he must never offend her so again. Although she had indignantly refused to believe the scandal, it nevertheless rankled, and she found herself watching her husband with jealous eyes, noticing his seeming indifference towards her, and his many absences from home. Then came a day when she caused her chair to be borne down Mount Street, at the very moment when Richard was coming out of number 16. That was enough for Lavinia. So, he was indeed tired of her. He loved another woman, some wretched widow. For the first time a real worry plagued her. She stayed at home that evening, and exerted all her arts to captivate her husband. But Richard, seeing John unhappy, reproachful every way he turned, his head on fire, his brain seething with conflicting arguments, hardly noticed her, and as soon as he might politely do so left her, to pace up and down the library floor, trying to make up his mind what to do. Lady Lavinia was stricken with horror. She had sickened him by her megrims, as Tracy had prophesied she would. He no longer cared for her. This was why he continually excused himself from accompanying her when she went out, 
for once in her life she faced facts, and the prospect alarmed her. If it was not already too late, she must try to win back his love, and to do this she realized she must cease to tease him for money, and also cease to snap at him whenever she felt at all out of sorts. She must charm him back to her. She had no idea how much she cared for him until now that she thought he did not care for her. It was dreadful. She had always been so sure of Dicky. Whatever she did, however exasperating she might be, he would always adore her. And all the time Richard, far from making love to Mrs. Fanshawe, was hearing anecdotes of his brother from her, little details of his appearance, things he had said. He drank in all the information, clutching eagerly at each fresh scrap of gossip, greedy to hear it. If it in any way concerned John, his brain was absorbed with this one subject, and he never saw when Lavinia smiled upon him, nor did he seem to hear her coaxing speeches. When she remarked, as she presently did, on his pallor, he almost snapped at her and left the room. Once she put her arms about him and kissed him on the lips, he put her gently aside, too worried to respond to the caress, but had she known it, grateful for it. His Grace of Andover, meeting his sister at Ranelagh Gardens, thought her face looked pinched and her eyes unhappy. He inquired the reason, but Lady Lavinia refused to confide even in him, and pleaded a headache. Andover, knowing her, imagined that she had been refused some kickshaw, and thought no more about it. He himself was very busy. Only two days before, a groom had presented himself at St. James Square, bearing a missive from Harper, very illegible and ill-spelt, but to the point. Your Grace, I have took the liberty of engaging this man, Douglas, in your name. I hope I shall soon be able to have carried out the rest of your Grace's instructions, and trust my conduct will meet with your Grace's approval. Very obediently, Mr. Harper. Tracy confirmed the engagement, and straightway dispatched the man to Andover, where the head groom would undoubtedly find work for him to do. He was amused at the blind way in which the man had walked into his trap, and meditated cynically on the frailty of human nature, which will always follow the great god Mammon. Not three days later came another letter, this time from Mr. Bullet, addressed to him at White's, under the name of Sir Hugh Grandison. It asked for the man Harper's character. His Grace of Andover answered it in the library of his own home, and smiled sarcastically as he wrote Harper down, exceeding honest and trustworthy, as I have always found. He was in the middle of the letter when the door was unceremoniously pushed open, and Andrew lounged into the room. His Grace looked up, frowning, not a whit dismayed by the coolness of his reception. His brother kicked the door to, and lowered his long limbs into a chair. "'May I ask what I owe the honour of this intrusion?' smiled Tracy dangerously. "'Richard,' was the cheerful reply. "'Richard, as I am not interested in either him or his affairs. "'How truly amiable you are to-day! "'But I think you'll be interested in this. "'Tis so vastly mysterious. "'Indeed, what is the matter?' "'Just what I want to know.' "'Tracy sighed wearily. "'Pray come to the point, Andrew, if point there be. "'I have no time to waste. "'Lord, busy, working. "'God have mercy!' The young rake stretched his legs out before him, and cast his eyes down their shapeliness. Then he stiffened and sat up, staring at one white stockinged ankle. "'Now, damn and curse it! Where did that come from?' he expostulated mildly. "'Where did what come from?' "'That great splash of mud on my leg. Brand new on this morning, and I've scarce set my nose without doors. Damn it, I say! A brand new—' "'Leg? Hey?' "'What's that you say?' "'Not. "'When you have quite finished your eulogy, "'perhaps you would consent to tell me your errand?' "'Oh, aye. "'But twenty shillings the pair. "'Think of it. "'Well, the point, there is one, you see, is this. "'It is Richard's desire that you honour him with your presence "'at Wincham on Friday week, at three in the afternoon exactly, "'to which effect he sends you this. "'He tossed a letter on to the desk. "'You are like to have the felicity of meeting me there.' Tracy ripped open the packet and spread the single sheet on the desk before him. He read it through very deliberately, turned it over as if in search of more, re-read it, folded it, and dropped it into the waste-basket at his side. He then picked up his quill and dipped it in the ink again. "'What think you?' 
demanded Andrew impatiently. His grace wrote tranquilly on to the end of the line. "'What think I of what?' "'Why, the letter, of course. What ails the man? Something of great import to impart to us, forsooth. What means he?' "'Yes, I noticed twas very badly worded,' commented Tracy. "'I have not the vaguest notion as to his meaning.' "'But what do you make of it? Lord, Tracy, don't be such a fish. Dick is summoning quite a party.' "'You appear to be in his confidence, my dear Andrew.' "'Allow me to congratulate you. No doubt we shall know more on, uh, Friday week at three o'clock.' "'Oh, you'll go, then?' "'Quite possibly,' he went on writing unconcernedly. "'And you've no idea what tis about. Dick is very strange. He hardly listens to what one has to say, and fidget, Lord!' "'Ah! I think he looks ill, and pon my soul, so does Lavy. Do you suppose there is aught amiss?' "'I really have no idea. Pray, do not let me detain you.' Andrew hoisted himself out of his chair. "'Oh, I'm not staying. Never fear. I suppose you cannot oblige me with, say, fifty guineas.' "'I should be loath to upset your suppositions,' replied his grace sweetly. "'You will not? Well, I didn't think you would somehow, but I wish you might contrive to let me have it, Tracy.' I've had prodigious ill luck of late, and the Lord knows tis not much I get from you. I don't want to ask Dick again. I should not let the performance grow monotonous, certainly, agreed the other. Fifty, you said. Forty-five would suffice. Oh, you may have it, shrugged his grace. At once? Blister me, but that's devilish good of you, Tracy. At once would be convenient to me. His grace produced a key from his vest pocket and unlocked a drawer in the desk. From it he took a small box. He counted out fifty guineas and added another to the pile. Andrew stared at it. "'What's that for?' he inquired. "'The stockings,' replied Tracy with a ghost of a smile. Andrew burst out laughing. "'That's good! Gad, but you're devilish amusing! Pwn rep you are!' He thanked his grace profusely, and gathering up the money, left the room. Outside he gave vent to a low whistle of astonishment. "'Tear nouns! You must be monstrous well pleased over something,' he marvelled. "'I shall awaken soon, I doubt not.' He chuckled a little as he descended the staircase, but his face was full of wonderment. Lovelace called nearly every day at Wincham House, but was always refused admittance, as Lady Lavinia deemed it prudent not to see him. There came a day, however, when he would not be gainsaid, and was ushered into her drawing-room. He kissed her hands lingeringly, holding them for a long while in his. "'Lavinia! Cruel, fair one!' She drew her hands away, not too well pleased at his intrusion. "'How silly, Harold! I cannot have you tease me every day!' She allowed him to sit by her on the window-seat, and he again possessed himself of her hands. Did she love him? She hoped he was not going to be foolish. Of course not. He did not believe her, and started to plead his suit, imploring her to come away with him. In vain Lady Lavinia begged him to be quiet. She had stirred up a blaze, and it threatened to consume her. He was so insistent that, expecting Richard at any moment, and terrified lest there should be a disturbance, she promised to give him an answer next evening, at the theatre. She managed to be rid of him in this way, and with a relieved sigh watched him walk down the square. She was very fond of dear Harry, but really he was dreadfully tiresome at times. She brought her tiny mirror out from her pocket and surveyed her reflection critically, giving a tweak to one curl and smoothing another back. She was afraid she was looking rather old this evening, and hoped that Richard would not think so. She glanced up at the clock, wondering where he was. Surely he should be in by now. Then she arranged a chair invitingly pushed a stool up to it, and sat down opposite. With a sigh she reflected that it was an entirely new departure for her to strive to please and captivate her husband, and she fell a-thinking of how he must have waited on her in the old days, waiting as she was waiting now, hoping for her arrival. Lady Lavinia was beginning to realize that perhaps Dick's life had not been all roses with her as a wife. The door opened, and Richard came into the room. Deep lines were between his brows, but his mouth was for once set firmly. He looked somberly down at her. 
thinking how very beautiful she was. Lady Lavinia smiled and nodded towards the chair she had prepared. "'Sit down, Dicky. I am so glad you have come. I was monstrous dull and lonely, I assure you.' "'Were you?' he said, fidgeting with her scissors. "'No, I will not sit down. I have something to say to you, Lavinia, something to tell you.' "'Oh, have you?' she asked. "'Something nice, Dicky. "'I fear you will hardly think so. "'I am about to make an end.' "'Oh! "'Oh, are you? "'Of what?' "'Of this. "'This deceitful life I am leading. "'Have been leading. "'I... "'I... "'I am going to confess the whole truth. "'Richard!' "'He let fall the scissors "'and paced restlessly away down the room. "'I... "'I tell you, Lavinia, "'I cannot endure it. "'I cannot. "'I cannot. "'The thought of what John may be bearing "'is driving me crazy. "'I must speak. "'You... "'You can't!' "'She gasped. "'After seven years, Dickie, "'for heaven's sake!' "'The colour ebbed and flowed in her cheeks. "'I cannot continue any longer "'this living of a lie. "'I have been feeling it more and more "'ever since... "'ever since I met Jack "'that time on the road. "'And now I can no longer stand it. Everywhere I go, I seem to see him, looking at me. You don't understand. Lavinia cast aside her work. No, no, I do not. Pone rep, but you should have thought of this before, Dick. I know it. Nothing can excuse my cowardice, my weakness. I know all that. But it is not too late, even now, to make amends. In a week they will all know the truth. What, what do you mean? I have requested all whom it concerns to come to Wincham the Friday after this. Good heavens, Dick, think! Dick! I have thought. God, how I have thought! It is not fair to me. Oh, think of your honour, Wincham. My honour is less than nothing. Tis of his that I think. She sprang up, clutching at his arm, shaking him. Richard, you are mad! "'You must not do this. You must not, I say.' "'I implore you, Lavinia, not to try to make me change my decision. "'It is of no use. Nothing you can say will make any difference.' "'She flew into a passion, flinging away from him, her good resolutions forgotten. "'You have no right to disgrace me. If you do it, I will never forgive you. I won't stay with you. I—' "'He broke in. This was what he had expected. He must not whine. This was retribution.' I know. I have faced that. She was breathless for a moment. He knew. He had faced it. He had taken her seriously. He always expected her to leave him. Oh, he must indeed be tired of her and wanted her to go. What was he saying? I know that you love Lovelace. I, I have known it for some time. Lavinia sank into the nearest chair. To what depths had her folly led her? I shall put no obstacle in the way of your flight. Of course, this was dreadful. Lady Lavinia buried her face in her hands and burst into tears. It was true, then. He did not love her. He loved Mrs. Fanshawe. She was to elope. She sobbed pitifully as the full horror of the situation struck her. The temptation to gather her into his arms almost overmastered Richard, but he managed to choke it down. If he allowed himself to kiss her, she would try to break his resolution. Mayhap she would succeed. So he looked away from her, tortured by the sound of her crying. Lavinia wept on, longing to feel his arms about her, ready to consent to anything if only he would show that he loved her. But when he made no movement towards her, pride came back, and flicking her handkerchief across her eyes, she rose to her feet. "'You are cruel, cruel, cruel. If you do this thing, I shall leave you. Now surely he would say something, contradict her. With an immense effort, Richard controlled himself. "'I am sorry, Lavinia,' he said in a queer, constrained voice. It was of no avail. She had killed his love, and he was longing to be rid of her. She walked to the door and turned. "'I see that you do not love me,' she said with deadly calmness. "'I understand perfectly.' Then, as she wrenched the handle round, "'I hate 
you she cried and fled her silken skirts rustling furiously down the corridor a door slammed in the distance and there was silence carstairs stood very still staring down at her crumpled embroidery presently he stooped to pick it up and her violet scent was wafted up to him he carried it to his lips passionately if lavinia had been able to see him it would have changed the whole state of affairs as it was she locked herself into her room and continued her cry in private when she had no more tears to shed she sat up and tried to think that she wanted to elope harold would be very good to her she was sure and she would doubtless lead a very exciting life but somehow the more she thought of it the less she wanted to elope then she remembered that dicky why had she never realized how much she cared for him was in love with some horrid widow and did not want her to remain with him the idea was not to be born she was not going to be the unwanted wife she would have to go away though not with lovelace dicky should not force her to elope with another man she would go somewhere alone she had forgotten she had no money the dowry that had been hers was spent years ago she was utterly dependent on her husband that settled it she must elope with harry oh was any one ever so beset she sobbed as her misery swept in upon her with full force why should i run away if i don't want to end of chapter twenty two recording by tara mendoza phoenix arizona september two thousand eleven Chapter Twenty Three of the Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter Twenty Three. Lady Lavinia goes to the play. Richard was away from home all next day, and his wife had plenty of time in which to meditate upon her situation. She had quite come to the conclusion that she must elope with Lovelace, and was only waiting for to-night to tell him so. She would never, never ask Richard to let her stay with him, now that she knew he loved another. Truly a most trying predicament. The Carstairs were going to-night to Drury Lane to see Garrick play one of his most successful comedies, The Beau Stratagem. The beau monde that would flock to see the inimitable archer was likely to be a very distinguished one especially as the cast held the added attraction of Mrs. Clive, and ordinarily Lady Lavinia would have looked forward with much excitement to seeing the piece. Today, however, she felt that she would far rather go to bed and cry, but Lovelace had to be answered, and besides that she had invited two cousins, new come from Scotland, to accompany her, and she could not fail them. So that evening saw her seated in her box, wonderfully gowned as usual, scanning the house, Behind her stood her husband. When she thought that this was the last time she would ever go with him to the theatre, she had much ado to keep from bursting into tears before them all. And in the chair at her side was the cousin, Mrs. Fleming. Mr. Fleming stood with his hands behind his back, exclaiming every now and then as his kinsman, young Charles Holt, pointed out each newcomer of note. He was a short, tubby little man, dressed in sober brown, very neat as regards his wrists and neckband, but attired, so thought Lavinia, for the country, and not for town. His dark suit contrasted strangely with Mr. Holt's rather garish mixture of apple-green and pink, with waistcoat of yellow, and Richard's quieter, but far more handsome, apricot and silver. His wig, too, was not at all modish, being of the scratch type that country gentlemen affected. His wife was the reverse of smart, but she was loud in her admiration of her more affluent cousin's stiff silks and laces. She had married beneath her, had Mrs. Fleming, and the Belmanoise had never quite forgiven the shocking misalliance. William Fleming was not but a simple Scotsman, whose father, even now the family shuddered at the thought, had been a farmer. Lavinia was not over-pleased that they should have elected to visit London, and still less pleased that they should evince such an affection for the honourable richard and his wife well to be sure lavvy tis pleasant to sit here and admire all the people exclaimed mrs fleming for perhaps the twentieth time i declare i am grown positively old-fashioned from having lived for so long in the country 
"'Yes, my dear, positively old-fashioned. "'I cannot but marvel at the great hoops every one is wearing. "'I am sure mine is not half the size of yours, "'and the lady down there in the stage-box has one even larger.' Lavinia directed her gaze towards the box in question. At any other time she would have been annoyed to see that the occupant was Lady Carlyle, her pet rival in all matters of fashion. Now she felt that nothing signified, and merely remarked that she considered those absurd garlands of roses on the dress quite grotesque. Behind Holt was directing Mr. Fleming's attention to a box at the back of the house. "'Pon my soul, William!' "'Tis the Duchess of Queensberry and her son, March, you know. "'I assure you, there is no one more amiable in town when I last visited her. "'Charles knows well nigh every one here,' remarked Mrs. Fleming ingenuously, "'and wondered why her cousin laughed. "'When the curtain rose on the first act, Lovelace was nowhere to be seen, "'and Lavinia tried to interest herself in the play. "'But it is difficult to be interested in anything when one's whole mind is occupied— with something else far more overwhelming. She was not the only one of the party that Garrick failed to amuse. Richard sat wretchedly in the shadow of the box, thinking how in a short while he would never again conduct his wife to the theatre, and never again sit at her side watching her every change of expression. In the first interval Lovelace had still not arrived, but many other acquaintances had arrived, and called to see the Carstairs. Markham, Wilding, Devereux, Sir John Fortescue, all came into the box at different times, paid homage to Lavinia, were introduced to Mrs. Fleming, laughed and cracked jokes with the men, and drifted away again. How was it she had never before realized how much she enjoyed her life, wondered Lavinia. She settled down to listen to the second act, and Garrick's skill caught her interest and held it. For a moment she forgot her woes, and clapped as heartily as any one, laughing as gaily. The next instant she remembered again, and sank back into her unutterable gloom. But Richard had heard her merry laugh, and his heart was even gloomier than hers. There was no help for it. Lavinia was delighted at the thought of leaving him. As the curtain fell, Mrs. Fleming suddenly demanded if it was not Tracy seated in the box over on the other side. Lavinia turned to look. In the box alone sat his grace, seemingly unaware of her presence. "'Is that not Tracy?' persisted Mrs. Fleming. "'I remember his face so well.' "'Yes,' nodded Lavinia, and waved to him. Andover rose, bowed, and left his box. In a few moments he was in their own, kissing his cousin's hand. Lavinia now caught sight of Lovelace, standing on the floor of the theatre, looking up at her. He, too, disappeared from view, and she guessed that he was coming to speak with her. He had evidently failed to perceive the Duke, who was just a little behind her in the shadow. Richard and Mr. Fleming had left the box— and only Charles Holt remained, engaging Mrs. Fleming's whole attention. If only Tracy would go, how was she ever to give Lovelace her answer with him sitting there so provokingly? Captain Lovelace knocked at the door. Carelessly she bade him enter, and affected surprise on seeing him. His grace looked at her through narrowed lids, and shot a swift glance at Lovelace, whose discomfiture at finding him there was palpable. Not a trace of emotion was visible on that impassive countenance, but Lavinia felt her brother's attitude to be sinister, as if he divined her wishes, and was determined to frustrate them. She watched him smile on Lovelace, and beg him to be seated. Whether by accident or design, she was not sure which, he had so placed the chairs that he himself was between her and the captain. Skillfully he drew Mrs. Fleming into the conversation, and rearranged his stage. Lavinia found herself listening to the amiable Mr. Holt, and out of the tail of her eye observed that Lovelace had fallen a victim to her cousin. She could find no way of speaking to him, and dared not even signal. So adroitly was his grace stage-managing the scene. Lavinia was now quite certain that he was managing it. Somehow he had guessed that she had arranged to speak to Lovelace to-night, and was determined to prevent her. How he had found out she could not imagine but she was too well acquainted with him to be surprised. He would never let her disgrace herself if he could help it. She knew that. In whatever manner he himself might behave, his sister's conduct must be above reproach. He would find some means of separating them until he could cause Lovelace to be removed. She did not in the least know how he would contrive to do this, but she never doubted that he could and would, and then she would have to stay with Richard. Richard, who did not want her, if only Tracy would go. Ah, he was rising. 
His Grace of Andover begged Captain Lovelace to bear him company in his box. He would brook no refusal. He bore his captive off in triumph. A minute later Mr. Fleming re-entered the box. The third act had just begun when Richard reappeared, and softly took his seat. On went the play. Neither Tracy nor Lovelace came to the box during the next interval, and from her point of vantage Lavinia could see that Andrew had been introduced to the latter. She could guess how cleverly his grace was keeping the captain by him. Lord Avon, who had only a week ago returned from Bath, came to pay his respects. He had much to tell dear Lady Lavinia. How Kamal Lily and Foulmouth had dared to fight a duel in Crescent Fields, and had been arrested. How furious the bow was, but how his age was beginning to tell on him, and how it was whispered that his power was waning. All of which, at any ordinary time, would have interested my lady quite prodigiously, but now bored and even annoyed her. On went the play. Scrub and Boniface kept the house in a roar. All but Richard and his wife were enthralled. The incomparable Kitty failed to hold Lavinia's attention. Would Lovelace manage to speak to her in the last interval? A solicitous inquiry from Mrs. Fleming roused her, and she had perforce to smile, to own to a slight headache, and to evince some interest in the play. One more interval. Would he come? She became aware of a hand laid on her shoulder. Richard's voice, gravely courteous, sounded in her ears. "'You are heated, my dear. Will you walk outside a little?' She felt a mad desire to cling to his hand, and suppressed it forcibly. She rose, hesitating. Mrs. Fleming decided the point. "'The very thing! How considerate of you, Mr. Carstairs! I shall like to walk amongst all the people, to be sure. Here is Charles, offering to escort us. What say you, lovey? "'Oh, I—I I shall be pleased to do what suits you best, cousin,' she answered. "'Then let us go, my love. Charles has an arm for each.' so we may leave our husbands to chat. They went out into the broad passage and walked towards the foyer. There Lord March I spied Lavinia, who was always a favourite with him, and came forward, offering his arm. Lavinia took it, thankful to escape from Mr. Holt's vapid conversation. She let March conduct her to where his mother was sitting, with Mr. Selwyn at her elbow. Someone fetched her a glass of her taffy, and Montague came to talk to her. Stepping out of his box, Richard fell into the arms of his grace of Andover. "'Ah, Dick!' Richard eyed him coldly. "'You wanted me?' Tracy saw Mr. Fleming approaching. "'Only to ask if I may return with you to Grosvenor Square.' "'I have something important to say.' "'Certainly,' bowed Richard, and turned aside. Lovelace, who had succeeded in escaping from the Belmanoir Claws, hurried in search of Lavinia. Not finding her in her box, he gathered she must be in the foyer, and made his way towards it. As soon as she saw him coming, she sat down her glass and rose to her feet. "'Oh, Captain Lovelace, have you come to fetch me back to my seat? I have scarce set my eyes on you this evening. No, Markham, you may not come. No, nor you, my lord. Madame?' She curtsied low to the old Duchess, and walked away on Harold's arm. When they were once in the deserted passage behind the boxes, he turned eagerly towards her. "'Well, my dearest. Well?' Lady Lavinia's mouth drooped miserably. "'Yes,' she said. "'I shall have to come with you.' The tone was damping, to say the least of it, but he did not seem to notice it. "'Lavinia, you mean it?' "'Yes,' she assented, still more dejectedly. "'My beautiful love, you will really come. When? At once? At—oh, no, no!' "'Darling, the sooner the better. I understand tis a great step to expect you to take in a hurry, but I assure you tis wisest. Can you come to-morrow?' Her big eyes dilated. "'No, no! No, I—oh, uh, I cannot leave Dickie so soon!' She ended with a sob. "'But, Lavinia, my dearest, you surely do not want to stay with him,' he cried. "'Yes, I do,' she answered. "'I—I I don't ever want to leave him.' This blighting speech left him gasping. You— But heavens, what are you saying? You love me. No, I don't, she contradicted. I always said I didn't. I love my husband. You are distraught, he exclaimed. If you love him, why do you consent to elope with me? She looked at him reproachfully. There is no one else, she said mournfully. Good Lord, what— I have to elope with someone, because Dick 
doesn't love me any more, you see, and I will come with you, and I will try to be good. He kissed her hand quickly. Sweetheart, I still think you are not yourself. You will think differently tomorrow. You do not really love Carstairs. She shut her mouth obstinately, tilting her regal little head. He watched her anxiously. If you really do love him, tis ridiculous to elope with me, he said. Her fingers tightened on his wrist. But I must. You don't understand, Harry. You must take me. Don't you want me? Of course I do. But not if you are longing to be somewhere else all the time. The whole thing seems preposterous. Tis all dreadful, dreadful. I have never been so unhappy in my life. I, oh, I wish I had not been so heedless and selfish. Lovelace pondered for a moment as they stood outside her box. Then, seeing that people were returning to their seats, he opened the door and took her in. Listen, dear, this is the maddest scheme ever I heard. But if you are able and determined, you shall carry it through. Come to my lodgings tomorrow evening. Bring as little baggage as possible. I will have all ready, and we will post at once to Dover. Then in time I hope you will forget Richard, and come to care for me a little. You are very, very good, Harry. Yes, I will do just as you say, and, oh, I am sorry to put you out like this. I am not but a plague to every one, and I wish I were dead. You don't really love me, and I shall be a burden. I do indeed love you he assured her, but within himself he could not help wishing that he had not fallen quite so passionately in love with her. "'I'll leave you now, sweet, for your husband will be returning at any moment.' He kissed her hands lightly. "'Ah, demain, fairest. How she sat through the last act, Lavinia could never afterwards imagine. She was longing to be at home, so soon to be home no longer, and quiet. Her head ached now, as Richard's had ached for weeks— more than anything did she want to rest it against her husband's shoulder, so temptingly near, and to feel his sheltering arms about her. But Dick was in love with Isabella Fanshawe, and she must sit straight and stiff in her chair, and smile at the proper places. At last the play was ended. The curtain descended on the bowing archer, and the house stamped and clapped its appreciation. The curtain rose again. What? Not finished yet? Oh, no, it was but Garrick leading Mrs. Clive forward. Would they never have done? Mrs. Fleming was standing. She supposed they were going, and got up. Someone put her cloak about her shoulders. Richard, for the last time. Mr. Holt escorted her to her coach, and put her and her cousin into it. He and Mr. Fleming had their chairs, so only Richard and Tracy went with the ladies. The Flemings were staying with friends in Brook Street, just off Grosvenor Square, so that when they had put Harriet down, only a few more yards remained to be covered. Lavinia wondered dully why Tracy had elected to come with them. What did he want? Was he going to warn Dick of her intended flight? He little knew the true state of affairs. At the foot of the staircase at Wincham House, she turned to say good night. She merely nodded to Tracy, but to Dick she extended her hand. He took it in his, kissing it, and she noticed how cold were his fingers how burning hot his lips. Then he released her, and she went slowly up the stairs to her room. His grace watched her through his eyeglass. When she was out of sight, he turned and surveyed Richard critically. "'If that is the way you kiss a woman, Lavinia has my sympathies,' he remarked. Richard's lips tightened. He picked up a stand of lighted candles and ushered his grace into the drawing-room. "'I presume you did not come to tell me that,' he asked. Your presumption is correct, Richard. I have come to open your eyes. You are too kind. His grace laid his hat on the table, and sat down on the arm of a chair. I think perhaps I am. It may interest you to hear that Lavinia intends to elope with our gallant friend, the captain. Richard bowed. You knew it? Certainly. Andover looked him over. May I ask what steps you are taking to prevent her? None. His grace's expression was quite indescribable. For a moment he was speechless, and then he reverted to heavy sarcasm. "'Pray, remember to be at hand, to conduct her to her chair,' he drawled. "'Upon my soul, you sicken me. I am grieved. There is a remedy. 
replied Carstairs significantly. Tracy ignored the suggestion. I suppose it is nothing to you that you lose her? No, it is nothing to you that she disgraces her name. Oh, no. My name, I think. Our name. Is it possible for her to disgrace yours? Richard went white, and his hand flew instinctively to his sword hilt. Tracy looked at him. Do you think I would soil my blade with you? He asked very softly. Richard's hand fell from the hilt. His eyes searched the other's face. You know, he asked at last, quite calmly. You fool, answered his grace gently. You fool, do you think I have not always known? Richard leaned against the mantel shelf. You never thought I was innocent. You knew that night. You guessed. The Duke sneered. Knowing both, could I suspect other than you? He asked insultingly. "'Oh, my God!' cried Carstairs suddenly. "'Why could you not have said so before?' The Duke's eyes opened wide. "'It has chafed you, eh? I knew it would. I've watched you.' He chuckled beneath his breath. "'And those fools never looked beneath the surface. One and all, they believed that John would cheat. John! They swallowed it tamely, and never even guessed at the truth. You at least did not believe? I?' Hardly. Knowing you for a weak fool and him for a quixotic fool, I rather jumped to conclusions. Instead, you tried to throw the blame on him. I would to God you had exposed me. So you have remarked. I confess I do not understand this heroic attitude. Why should I interfere in what was none of my business? What proof had I? Why did you raise no demur? What motive had you? I should have thought it fairly obvious. Richard stared at him, puzzled. Gad, Richard! But you are singularly obtuse. Have I not pointed out that John was a quixotic fool? When did I say he was a weak one? You mean— You mean you wanted Lavinia to marry me, because you thought to squeeze me as you willed? asked Carstairs slowly. His grace's thin nostrils wrinkled up. "'You are so crude,' he complained. "'It suited you that Jack should be disgraced. "'You thought I should seize his money. "'You, you, rogue. "'But you will admit that I at least am an honest rogue. "'You are, er, uh, a dishonest saint. "'I would sooner be what I am. "'I know there is nothing on God's earth more vile than I am,' "'replied Carstairs violently. "'His grace sneered openly.' "'Very pretty, Richard. But a little tardy, methinks.' He paused, and something seemed to occur to him. "'Tis why you purpose to let Lavinia go, I suppose. You confess the truth on Friday, eh?' Richard bowed his head. "'I have not the right to stop her. She chooses her own road.' "'She knows?' sharply. "'She has always known. The jade! And I never guessed it.' He paused. Yes, I understand your heroic attitude. I am sorry I cannot pander to it. In spite of all this, I cannot permit my sister to ruin herself. She were as effectually ruined, and the day she stayed with me. Pshaw! After seven years, who is like to care one way or the other which of you cheated? Play the man for once and stop her. She loves Lovelace, I tell you. What of it? She will recover from that. No, I cannot ask her to stay with me. T'would be damnably selfish. His grace appeared exasperated. For God, you are a fool. Ask her, ask her, force her. Kick Lovelace from your house and abandon the heroic pose. I beg of you. Do you suppose I want to lose her? cried Carstairs. Tis because I love her so much that I will not stand in the way of her happiness. The Duke flung round and picked up his hat. "'I am sorry I cannot join with you in your heroics. I must take the matter into my own hands, as usual, it seems. Lord, but you should have learnt to make her obey you, my good Dick. She has led you by the nose ever since she married you, and she was a woman who wanted mastering.' He went over to the door and opened it. "'I will call upon you to-morrow. 
when I shall hope to find you more sane. They do not purpose to leave until late. I know, for Lovelace has promised to Malaby at three o'clock. There is time in which to act. I shall not interfere, repeated Richard. His grace sneered. And so you have remarked. It remains for me to do. Good night. End of chapter 23 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, September 2011「was hardly befitting one who contemplated an elopement. A weight seemed to rest on her chest. Hopeless misery was gathered about her head. She could not bring herself to drink her chocolate, and feeling that inaction was the worst of all, she very soon crawled out of bed and allowed her maid to dress her. Then she went with dragging steps to her boudoir, wondering all the time where Richard was and what he was doing. She seated herself at her window and looked out onto the square, biting the edge of her handkerchief in the effort to keep back her tears. Richard was in no more cheerful mood. He, too, left his chocolate untouched, and went presently down to the breakfast-table, and looked at the red sirloin with a feeling of acute nausea. He managed to drink a cup of coffee, and immediately afterwards left the room and made his way to his wife's boudoir. He told himself he was acting weakly, and had far better avoid her, but in the end he gave way to his longing to see her, and knocked on one white panel. Lavinia's heart leapt. How well she knew that knock! "'Come in!' she called, and tried to compose her features. Richard entered and shut the door behind him. "'Oh! Oh, good morning!' she smiled. "'You wanted to speak with me, Dick?' "'I—yes, that is—' uh, uh, "'Have you the Carlyle's invitation?' It was perhaps an unlucky excuse— Lavinia turned away and fought against her tears. "'I—I I believe tis in my escritoire,' she managed to say. "'I—I I will look for it.' She rose and unlocked the bureau, standing with her back to him. "'Tis no matter,' stammered Carstairs. "'I only—'twas but that I could not find it. Pray do not disturb yourself.' "'Oh, not at all,' she answered, scattering a handful of letters before her. "'Yes.' "'Here it is.' She came up to him with the note in her hand, extending it. Carstairs looked down at the golden head, and at the little face with its eyes cast down, and red mouth set so wistfully. Heavens, how could he bear to live without her? Mechanically he took the letter. Lavinia turned away, and as she stepped from him something snapped in Richard's brain. The luckless invitation was flung down. "'No! By God, you shall not!' he cried suddenly. Lavinia stopped trembling. "'Oh, what do you mean?' she fluttered. The mists were gone from his mind. Everything was clear now. Lavinia should not elope with Lovelace. In two strides he was at her side, had caught her by the shoulders and swung her to face him. "'You shall not leave me. Do you understand? I cannot live without you.' Lavinia gave a little cry full of relief, joy, and wonderment, and shrank against him. "'Oh, please, please forgive me and keep me with you,' she cried, and clung to the lapels of his coat. Carstairs swept her right off the ground in the violence of his embrace, but she did not mind. Although the crushing was ruinous to her silks, silks were no longer uppermost in her brain. She returned his kisses eagerly, sobbing a little. When Carstairs was able to say anything beyond how he loved her, he demanded if she did not love him. "'Of course I do!' she cooed. I always, always did. Only I was so selfish and so careless. He carried her to the sofa and sat down with her on his knee, trying to look into her face, but she had somehow contrived to hide it on his shoulder, and he did not succeed. Then you never loved that puppy? he asked, amazed. One hand crept up to his other shoulder. Oh, Dickie, no! And you, you don't love that horrid Mrs. Fanshawe, do you? He was still more amazed. Mrs. Fanshawe? 
"'Great heavens, no! You never thought that, Shirley?' "'I did, I did. Since you were always at a house, and so cold to me, how could I help it?' "'Cold to you? My dearest, Shirley not. "'You were, you truly were, and I was so miserable. I—' I thought I had been so unreasonable and so horrid that you had ceased to lo love me, and I did not know what to do, and, and then you told me that you were going to, to confess, and I lost my temper and said I would not, not stay with you, and, but I never, never meant it, and when you seemed to expect me to go, I, I did not know what to do again. He patted her shoulder comfortingly. Sweetheart, don't cry. I had no idea of all of this. Why, I was sure that you loved Lovelace. I never doubted it. Why in the world did you not tell me the truth? She sat up at that and looked at him. Why, how could I? she demanded. I was quite certain that you loved Isabella Fanshawe, and I felt I had to go away, and I could not do it alone. So, so, so of course I had to elope, and I told Harold last night that I would go with him, and I'm afraid he didn't quite want me when he heard that I loved you. Oh, Dicky, darling, you'll tell him that I won't go with him, won't you? He could not help laughing. Ay, I'll tell him, bone rep, my sweetheart. I can find it in me to be sorry for him. Oh, he will not mind for long, she said philosophically. He loves so easily, you see. But you, Dick, why did you go so often, so very often, to Mrs. Fanshawe? His face grew solemn. She knew Jack in Vienna. I, I wanted to hear all she could tell me of him. I could think of nothing else. Oh, Dicky, how, how wickedly foolish I have been! And twas that that made you so cold. And I thought, oh dear! He drew her head down on to his shoulder again. My poor love, why tis the kindest lady imaginable. But as to loving her, he kissed her hand lingeringly. I love, and have always loved, a far different being, a naughty, willful, captivating little person who— Lady Lavinia clasped her arms about his neck. You make me so very, very dreadful. I have indeed been naughty. I— And you'll be so many times again, he told her, laughing. No, no, I will try to be good. I do not want you good, Richard assured her. I want you to be your own dear self. Lady Lavinia disengaged herself with a contented little sigh, and stood up. How charming it is to be happy again, to be sure, she remarked naively. To think that only half an hour ago I was wishing to be dead. She went over to the glass and straightened her hair. Richard looked at her rather anxiously. Lavinia, you— you quite understand. I am going to tell everyone the truth next Friday, he asked. Yes, I do, of course. Tis dreadfully disagreeable of you, but I suppose you will do it. I do hope people will not refuse to recognize us, though. No one would ever refuse to recognize you, dearest. She brightened. Do you really think so? Well, perhaps after all. Twill not be so very horrid, and— and you will like to have Jack again, won't you? Yes, I knew you would. Oh, twill all be quite comfortable after a little while, I make no doubt. His grace of Andover arose betimes, and early sallied forth into the street. He called a chair and drove to an address in the Strand, where lodged a certain Colonel Shepherd. Half an hour did he spend with the Colonel, and when he at length emerged from the house, the curl of his lip betokened satisfaction. He did not at once hail a chair, but walked alone in the direction of St. James's, entering the park in company with one Dare, who seven years before had given a certain memorable card party. Dare was pleasantly intrigued over Richard's latest oddity. "'Have you any idea what tis about, Belmont?' he inquired. "'Has he written you to come as well?' "'I believe. I did receive some communication from Carstairs, yes. I remember.' Andrew brought it. Well, what does it mean? Fortescue is bidden, and Davenant, tis very curious. My dear, dear, I am not in Richard's confidence. 
"'We should doubtless hear all that there is to hear at the given time. "'Mysteries do not interest me. "'But twill be a pleasant reunion. "'Fortescue and Davenant, you say. "'Strange. "'I have heard that Evans and Millwood have also received their some invitations. "'It should be most entertaining.' "'Tis prodigious curious,' repeated Dare. "'No one can imagine what tis all about.' "'Ah!' His Grace's thin lips twitched. Midway through the afternoon he repaired to Wincham House, and was ushered into the library. Richard sat writing, but rose on seeing him, and came forward. It struck his Grace that Carstairs was looking quite happy. "'You seem cheerful, Richard.' "'I am,' smiled his brother-in-law. "'I am much relieved to hear it. I have seen Shepherd.' "'Shepherd?' interrogated Carstairs. "'Lovelace's Colonel, my dear Richard. You may count on Captain Harold's departure, on an important mission in, say, forty-eight hours. "'You may count on Captain Harold's departure in very much less, Tracy,' said Carstairs, a twinkle in his eye. The Duke started forward. "'She has gone,' he almost hissed. "'Gone?' "'No. She is in the drawing-room with him. With Lovelace. And you permit it. You stand by and watch another man say farewell to my wife. But I am not watching, as you see.' The anger died out of his grace's eyes. "'Farewell. Do you tell me you at last came to your senses?' "'We found that we both laboured under a delusion,' replied Carstairs pleasantly. "'I am delighted to hear you say so. "'I hope you will, for the future, keep a stricter hold on Lavinia. "'Do you?' "'I do. "'I think I will not undo what I have done. "'Lovelace were perhaps better out of the way for a time. "'Why, I have no objection to that,' bowed Richard. "'His grace nodded shortly and picked up his hat. "'Then there remains nothing more to be done in the matter.' "'He looked piercingly across at Carstairs. "'She did not love him?' Richard gave a happy little sigh. "'She loves me.' The heavy lids drooped again. "'You cannot conceive my delight. If she indeed loves you, she is safe. I thought she had not got it in her. Pray bear my respects to her.' His hand was on the doorknob, when something seemed to occur to him. "'I take my presence at Wincham on Friday will not be necessary,' he said cynically. Richard flushed. "'It will not be necessary.' Mm, "'Then I am sure you will excuse me, and I do not appear. I have other, more important affairs on hand. But I shall be loath to miss the heroics,' he added pensively, and chuckled. "'Au revoir, my good Richard.' Richard bowed him out thankfully. Presently the front door opened and shut again, and looking out of the window, he saw that Captain Harold Lovelace had taken his departure. He was now awaiting Mr. Warburton, whom he had sent in search of John some days ago. He should have been here by now, he thought, but perhaps he had been detained. Richard was aching to hear news of his brother, longing to see him once more, but at the same time he was dreading the meeting. He shrank from the thought of looking into Jack's eyes, cold, even scornful. It was not possible, so he reasoned, that Jack should feel no resentment. "'Mr. Warburton, sir!' Carstairs turned, and came eagerly forward to greet the newcomer. "'Well? Well?' Mr. Warburton spread out deprecating hands. "'Alas, Mr. Carstairs!' Richard caught his arm. "'What mean you? He is not dead?' "'I do not know, sir.' "'You could not find him? Quick, tell me.' "'Alas, no, sir. But the checkers, he said, surely they knew something.' "'Not, Mr. Carstairs.' Out came Mr. Warburton's snuff-box. Very deliberately he took a pinch shaking the remains from his fingertips. The host, Chadber, an honest man, though lacking in humour, has not set eyes on my lord for well nigh six months, not since I went to advise my lord of the earl's death. But Warburton, he cannot be far. He is not dead, or surely not that. No, no, Master Dick, soothed the lawyer. We should have heard of it had he been killed. I fear he has gone abroad once more. It seems he often spoke of travelling again. "'Abroad! God, don't let me lose him again!' He sank into a chair, his head in his hands. "'Tot, I implore you, Mr. Carstairs, do not despair yet. We have no proof that he has left the country. I dare say we shall find him almost at once. 
Chadber thinks it likely he will visit the inn again ere long. Calm yourself, Master Dick. He walked up to the man and laid a hand on one heaving shoulder. We shall find him, never fear. But do not, I know, twould grieve him to see you so upset, Master Dick. Pray do not. If I could only make amends, groaned Richard. Well, sir, are you not about to? He would not wish you to distress yourself like this. He was so fond of you. Pray, pray do not. Carstairs rose unsteadily and walked to the window. I crave your pardon, Mr. Warburton. You must excuse me. I have been living in hell this last week. Warburton came over to his side. Master Dick, I... You know I have never cared for you as well as you cared for him. Uh, yes, sir, exactly. And of late years I have may, perhaps, been hard. I would desire to, uh, apologize for any unjust, uh, thoughts I have harbored against you. I, I possibly, I never quite understood. That is all, sir. He blew his nose rather violently, and then his hand found Richard's. Richard Carstairs had plenty to occupy him for the rest of the week. Arrangements had to be made, a house acquired for Lavinia, Wincham House to be thoroughly cleaned and put in order, awaiting its rightful owner. Once she had made up her mind to face the inevitable, Lavinia quite enjoyed all the preparations. The new house in Great German Street she voted charming, and she straightway set to work to buy very expensive furniture for it, and to superintend all the alterations. In her present penitent mood, she would even have accompanied her husband to Wincham on Monday to stand by him on the fateful Friday, but this he would not allow, insisting that she remain in town until his return. So she fluttered contentedly from Grosvenor Square to German Street, very busy and quite happy. Carstairs was to travel to Wincham on Monday, arriving there the following evening in company with Andrew, whom he was taking as far as Andover. His lordship had lately embroiled himself in a quarrel over a lady when deep in his cups and owing to the subsequent duel at Barn Elms, and the almost overpowering nature of his debts, he deemed it prudent to go into seclusion for a spell. Tracy disappeared from town in the middle of the week, whither no one knew, but it was universally believed that he had gone to Scotland on a visit. Monday at length dawned fair and promising. After bidding his wife a very tender farewell, and gently drying her wet eyelashes with his own handkerchief, Richard set out with his brother-in-law in the big travelling chaise soon after noon. Andrew had quite recovered his hitherto rather dampened spirits, and produced a dice-box from one pocket and a pack of cards from the other, wherewith to beguile the tedium of the journey. End of chapter 24 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona September 2011《Chapter 25 of the Black Moth》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza — The Black Moth by Georgette Hare — Chapter 25 — His Grace of Andover Captures the Queen Diana stood in the old oak porch riding whip in hand, and the folds of her voluminous gown over her arm. Miss Betty stood beside her, surveying her with secret pride. Diana's eyes seemed darker than ever, she thought, and the mouth more tragic. She knew that the girl was, to use her own expression, moping quite prodigiously for that Mr. Carr. Not all that she could do to entertain Diana entirely chased away the haunting sadness in her face. For a time she would be gay, but afterwards the laughter died away, and she was silent. Many times had Miss Betty shaken her fist at the absent John. Presently Diana gave a tiny sigh, and looked down at her aunt, smiling. "'You would be surprised how excellently well Harper manages the horses,' she said. "'He is quite a godsend. So much nicer than that stupid William.' "'Indeed, yes,' agreed Miss Betty. Only think, my dear, he was groom to Sir Hugh Grandison. I saw the letter Sir Hugh writ your papa. A remarkable elegant epistle, I assure you, my love. Diana nodded and watched the new groom ride up, leading her mount. He jumped down and, touching his hat, stood awaiting his mistress's pleasure. 
Diana went up to the cob, patting his glossy neck. "'We are going towards Ashley today, Aunt,' she said. "'I am so anxious to find some berries, and Harper tells me they grow in profusion not far from here. "'Now, my dear, pray do not tire yourself by going too far. "'I doubt it will rain before long, and you will catch your death of cold.' Diana laughed at her. <laughs> oh, no, aunt. Why, the sky is almost cloudless. But we shall not be long, I promise you. Only as far as cross down woods and back again. She gave her foot to the groom, just as Mr. Beulet came out to watch her start. Really, my dear, I must ride with you to-morrow, he told her. Tis an age since we have been out together. Why, papa, will you not accompany me this afternoon? cried Diana eagerly. I should so like it. It struck her aunt that Harper awaited the answer to this question rather anxiously. She watched him, puzzled. However, when Mr. Bullet had refused, she could not see any change in his expression, and concluded that she must have been mistaken. So with a wave of her hand, Diana rode away, the groom following at a respectful distance. Yet somehow Miss Betty was uneasy. A presentiment of evil seemed to touch her, and when the riders had disappeared round a bend in the road, she felt an insane desire to run after them and call her niece back. She gave herself a little shake, saying that she was a fond old woman, over-anxious about Diana. Nevertheless, she laid a detaining hand on her brother's arm as he was about to go indoors. "'Wait, Horace. You—you you will ride with Di more frequently.' "'Will you not?' He looked surprised. "'You are uneasy, Betty?' "'Oh, uneasy. Well, yes, a little. I do not like her to go alone with a groom, and we do not know this man.' "'My dear, I had the very highest references from Sir Hugh Grandison, who, I am sure, would never recommend any one untrustworthy. Why, you saw the letter yourself.' "'Yes, yes, doubtless I am very stupid.' But you will ride with her after to-day, will you not? Certainly, I will accompany my daughter when I can spare the time. He replied with dignity, and with that she had to be content. Diana rode leisurely along the lane, beside great trees and hedges that were a blaze of riotous colour. Autumn had turned the leaves dull gold and flame, mellow brown and deepest red, with flaming orange intermingled and touches of copper here and there, where some beech-tree stood. The lane was like a fairy picture, too gorgeous to be real. The trees, meeting overhead, but let the sunlight through in patches, so that the dusty road beneath was mottled with gold. The hedges retained their greenness, and where there was a gap, a vista of fields presented itself, and then they came upon a clump of berries, black and red, growing the other side of the little stream, that meandered along the lane in a ditch. Diana drew up and addressed her companion. "'See, Harper, there are berries. We need go no further.' She changed the reins to her right hand, and made as if to spring down. "'The place I spoke of, tis but a short way on, miss,' ventured the man, keeping his seat. She paused. "'But why will these not suffice?' "'Well, miss, if you like. But those others were a deal finer.' "'Seems a pity not to get some.' "'Diana looked doubtfully along the road. "'Tis not far.' "'No, miss. "'But another quarter of a mile, "'and then down the track by the wood.' "'Still she hesitated. "'I do not want to be late,' she demurred. "'No, miss, of course not. "'I only thought as how we might come back "'by way of Chorley Fields. "'Round by the mill? "'Hm. "'Yes, miss.' Then, as soon as we get past it, there is a clear stretch of turf almost up to the house. Her eye brightened. A gallop? Very well. But let us hurry on. She touched the cob with her heel, and they trotted on briskly out of the leafy canopy along the road, with blue sky above and pasture land around. After a little while the wood came in sight, and in a minute they were riding down the track at right angles to the road. Harper was at Diana's heels, drawing nearer. Half unconsciously she quickened her pace. There was not a soul in sight. They were coming to a bend in the road, and now Harper was alongside. 
Choking a ridiculous feeling of frightened apprehension, Diana drew rein. "'I do not perceive those berries,' she said lightly. "'No, miss,' was the immediate response. "'They are just a step into the wood. If you care to dismount here, I can show you.' Nothing could be more respectful than the man's tone. Diana shook off her nervous qualms and slipped down. Harper, already on the ground, took the cob's rein and tied both horses to a tree. Diana gathered her skirts over her arm and picked her way through the brambles to where he had pointed. The blackberry hedges he held back for her entrance swung back after they had passed, completely shutting out all view of the road. There were no berries. Diana's heart was beating very fast, all her suspicions springing to life again, but she showed no sign of fear as she desired him to hold the brambles back again for her to pass out. For there are no berries here as you can see for yourself. She swept round and walked calmly toward the bushes. Then how, she could never quite remember, she was seized from behind, and before she had time to move, a long piece of silk was flung over her head and drawn tight across her mouth, while an arm, as of steel, held and controlled her. Fighting madly, she managed to get one arm free and struck out furiously with her slender crop. There was a brief struggle, and it was twisted from her grasp, and her hands tied behind her, despite all her efforts to be free. Then her captor swung her writhing into his arms, and strode away through the wood without a word. Diana was passive now, reserving her strength for when it might avail her something, but above the gag her eyes blazed with mingled fright and fury. She noticed that she was being carried not into the wood, but along it, and was not surprised when they emerged on to the road where it had rounded the bend. With a sick feeling of terror, she saw a coach standing in the road, and guessed even before she knew what was her fate. Through a haze, she saw a man standing at the door, and then she was thrust into the coach and made to sit down on the softly cushioned seat. All her energies were concentrated in fighting against the faintness that threatened to overcome her. She won gradually, and strained her ears to catch what was being said outside. She caught one sentence in a familiar, purring voice. Set them loose, and tie this to the pummel. Then there was silence. Presently she heard footsteps returning, an indistinguishable murmur from Harper, and the door opened to allow his grace of Andover to enter the coach. It gave a lurch and rumbled on. Tracy looked down with a slight smile into the gold-flecked eyes that blazed so indignantly into his. A thousand apologies, Miss Bullet. Allow me to remove this scarf. As he spoke, he untied the knot, and the silk fell away from her face. For a moment she was silent, struggling for words, wherewith to give vent to her fury. Then the red lips parted and the small white teeth showed, clenched tightly together. You cur! She flung at him in a panting undertone. Oh, you cur! You coward! Undo my hands. With pleasure. He bowed and busied himself with this tighter knot. Pray accept my heartfelt apologies for incommoding you so grievously. I am sure that you will admit the necessity. Oh, that there were a man here to avenge me, she raged. His grace tugged at the stubborn knot. There are three outside, he answered blandly. But I do not think they are like to oblige you. He removed her bonds and sat back in the corner, enjoying her. His eyes fell on her bruised wrists, and at once his expression changed, and he frowned, leaning forward. "'Believe me, I did not mean that,' he said, and touched her hands. She flung him off. "'Do not touch me.' "'I beg your pardon, my dear.' He leaned back again, nonchalantly. "'Where are you taking me?' she demanded, trying to conceal the fear in her voice. "'Home.' replied his grace. Home! Incredulously, she turned to look at him, hope in her eyes. Home, he reiterated. Our home. The hope died out. You are ridiculous, sir. Tis an art, my dear, most difficult to acquire. Sir, Mr. Everard, whoever you are, if you have any spark of manliness in you, of chivalry, if you care for me at all, you will this instant set me down. Never had she seemed more beautiful, more desirable. Her eyes shone with unshed tears, soft and luminous, and the tragic mouth pleaded, even trying to smile. 
"'It would appear that none of these attributes belongs to me,' murmured his grace, and wondered if she would weep. He had never a taste for a weeping woman. But Diana was proud. She realized that tears, prayers and all, would avail her nothing, and she was determined not to break down, at least in his presence. Tracy was surprised to see her arrange her skirts and settle back against the cushions in the most unconcerned manner possible. "'Then, since you are so ungallant, sir, pray tell me what you purpose doing with me.' The tone was light, even bantering, but with his marvellous, almost uncanny perspicacity, he sensed the breathless terror behind it. "'Why, my dear, I had planned to marry you,' he answered, bowing. The knuckles gleamed white on her clenched hand. "'And if I refuse?' "'I do not think you will refuse me, my dear.' She could not repress a shiver. "'I do refuse!' she cried sharply. The smile with which he received this statement drove the blood cold in her veins. "'Wait. I think you will be glad to marry me. In the end,' he drawled. Her great eyes were hunted, desperate, and her face was very white. The dry lips parted. I think you will be very sorry when my father comes. The indulgent sneer brought the blood racing back to her cheeks. And he will come. His grace was politely interested. Really? But I do not doubt it, Diana. And he knows where to come. He will find a way. Never fear. She laughed with a confidence she was far from feeling. I do not fear. Not in the least. I should be delighted to welcome him, promised his grace. I do not anticipate a refusal of your hand from him. No, Diana too could sneer. No, my dear, not after a little persuasion. Who are you? She shot at him. His shoulders shook in the soundless laugh peculiar to him. I am several people, child. So I apprehend, she retorted smoothly. Sir Hugh Grandison amongst them? Ah, you have guessed that. It rather leaps to the eye, sir. She spoke in what was almost an exact imitation of his sarcastic tone. True. It was neatly done. I flatter myself. Quite marvellous indeed. He was enjoying her as he had rarely enjoyed a woman before. Others had sobbed and implored, railed and raved. He had never till now met one who returned him word for word, using his own weapons against him. "'Who else have you the honour to be?' she asked, stifling a yawn. "'I am Mr. Everard, child, and Duke of Andover.' Then she turned her head and looked at him with glittering eyes. "'I have heard of you, sir,' she said evenly. "'You are like to hear more, my dear. That is as may be, your grace.' Now she understood the elaborate hilt of the mysterious sword with the coronet on it, wrought in jewels. She wondered whether Jack had it still, wherever he was, if only some wonderful providence would bring him to her now in her dire need. There was no one to strike a blow for her. She was entirely at the mercy of a ruthless libertine, whose reputation she knew well, and whose presence filled her with dread and a speechless loathing. She felt very doubtful that her father would succeed in finding her. If only Jack were in England, he would come to her, she knew. His grace leaned towards her, laying a thin white hand on her knee. My dear, be reasonable. I am not such a bad bargain, after all. The tenderness in his voice filled her with horror. He felt her shrink away. Take your hand away, she commanded throbbingly. Do not touch me. He laughed softly, and at the sound of it she controlled her terrors, and dropped again to the mocking tone she had adopted. What? Ungallant still, your grace. Pray, keep your distance. The pistol holster on the wall at her side caught her attention. Instantly she looked away, hoping he had not observed her. Very little escaped his grace. I am desolated to have to disappoint you, my dear. It is empty. She laid a careless hand on the holster verifying his statement. This? Oh, I had guessed it, your grace. He admired her spirit more and more. Was there ever such a girl? My name is Tracy, he remarked. She considered it with her head tilted to one side. 
"'I do not like your name, sir,' she answered. "'There was no thought of pleasing you when I was christened,' he quoted lazily. "'Hardly, sir,' she said. "'You might be my father.' It was a master stroke, and for an instant his brows drew together. Then he laughed. "'Merci du compliment, mademoiselle. I admire your wit.' I protest. I am overwhelmed. May I ask when we are like to arrive at our destination? We should reach Andover soon after eight, my dear. So it was some distance he was taking her. I suppose you had the wit to provide food for the journey? She yawned. You will not wish to exhibit me at an inn, I take it? He marvelled at her indomitable courage. We shall halt at an inn, certainly and my servant will bring you refreshment. That will be in about an hour. So long, she frowned. Then pray excuse me, and I compose myself to sleep a little. I am like to find the journey somewhat tedious, I fear. She shifted farther into the corner, leaned her head back against the cushions, and closed her eyes. Thus outwitting his grace, for it is impossible to be passionate with a girl who feigns sleep when she should be struggling to escape from you. So Tracy, who, whatever else he might lack, possessed a keen sense of humour, settled himself in his corner and followed her example. So they jogged on. Arrived at length at the inn, the coach pulled up slowly. Diana opened her eyes with a great assumption of sleepiness. "'Already?' she marvelled. "'I trust you have slept well,' said his grace suavely. "'Excellently well, I thank you, sir,' was the unblushing reply. I am relieved to hear you say so, my dear. I had thought you unable to. Your mouth kept shut so admirably. Doubtless you have schooled your jaw not to drop open when you sleep sitting up. I wish I might do the same. The triumph in his voice was thinly veiled. She found nothing to say. He rose. With your leave, I will go to procure you some refreshment, child. Do not think me uncivil if I remind you that a servant stands without— either door. I thank you for the kind thought, she smiled, but her heart was sick within her. He disappeared, returning a few moments later, with a glass of wine and some little cakes. I deplore the scanty nature of your repast, he said, but I do not wish to waste time. You shall be more fittingly entertained when we reach Andover. Diana drank the wine gratefully, and it seemed to put new life into her. The food almost choked her, but rather than let him see it, she broke a cake in half and started to eat, playing to gain time, time in which to allow her father a chance of overtaking them before it was too late. She affected to dislike the cake, and rather petulantly demanded a maid of honour. Tracy's eyes gleamed. "'I fear I cannot oblige you, my dear. When we are married, you can go to Richmond, and you shall have maids of honour in plenty.' He relieved her of her glass, taking it from hands that trembled pitifully. The rest of the journey was as some terrible nightmare. She felt that she dared no longer feign sleep. She was terrified at what his grace might do, and kept him at arm's length by means of her tongue and all her woman's wit. As a matter of fact, Andover had himself well in hand, and had no intention of letting his passion run away with him. But as the time went on, and the light went, some of Diana's control seemed to slip from her and she became a little less the self-possessed woman, and a little more the trapped and frightened child. When they at last reached Andover Court, and his grace assisted her to alight, her legs would barely carry her up the steps to the great iron-clamped door. She trembled anew as he took her hand. On the threshold he paused and bowed very lowly. "'Welcome to your future home, my queen,' he murmured, and led her in, past wooden-faced footmen who stared over her head, to his private room, where a table was set for two. He would have taken her in his arms then, but she evaded him and slipped wearily into a chair. "'I protest,' she managed to say. "'I protest I am faint through want of food.' Andover, looking at her white lips, believed her. He took a seat opposite. Two footmen came to wait on them, and although her very soul was shamed that they should see her there, she was thankful for their restraining presence." End of chapter 25 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, September 2011
Chapter Twenty Six of the Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter Twenty Six. My Lord rides to frustrate his grace. My lord yawned most prodigiously, and let fall the spectator. His eyes roved towards the clock, and noted with disgust that the hands pointed to half after five. He sighed and picked up the rambler. His host and hostess were visiting some miles distant, and were not likely to be back until late, so my lord had a long, dull evening in front of him, which he relished not at all. Lady O'Hara had tried to induce him to accompany them, promising that he would meet no one he knew, but he had for once been prudent, and refused steadfastly. So, my lady, after pouting crossly at him, and assuring him that he was by far the most obstinate and disagreeable man that she had ever come across, not excepting her husband, who, to be sure, had been quite prodigiously annoying all day, relented, told him she understood perfectly, and even offered to kiss him to make up for her monstrous ill-humour. Jack accepted the offer promptly, waved farewell to her from the porch, and returned to the empty drawing-room to while away the time with two numbers of the spectator and his own thoughts till dinner, which was to be later than usual to-day, on account of an attack of vapours which had seized the cook. His thoughts were too unpleasant to be dwelt on. Everything in his world seemed to have gone awry, so he occupied himself with what seemed to him a particularly uninteresting number of the spectator. The sun had almost disappeared, and very soon it became too dark to read. No candles having been brought as yet, my lord, very unromantically, went to sleep in his chair. Whether he would have eventually snored is not known, for not more than a quarter of an hour afterwards the butler roused him with the magic words, "'Dinner is served, sir.' Carstairs turned his head lazily. "'What's that you say, James?' "'Dinner is served, sir,' repeated the man, and held the door wide for him to pass out. "'Faith, I'm glad to hear it.' My lord rose leisurely and pulled his cravat more precisely into position. Although he was to be alone, he gave his costume a touch here and there, and flicked a speck of dust from one great cuff with his elegant lace handkerchief. He strolled across the old panelled hall to the dining-room, and sat down at the table. The curtains were drawn across the windows, and clusters of candles in graceful silver holders were arranged on the table, shedding a warm light on to the white damask and the shining covers. The footman presented a fish, and my lord permitted a little to be put on his plate. The butler desired to know if Mr. Carr would drink claret or burgundy or ale. Mr. Carr would drink claret. A sirloin of beef next made its appearance, and went away considerably smaller. Then before my lord was spread an array of dishes— Partridges flanked one end, a pasty stood next, a cream, two chickens, a duck, and a ham of noble proportions. My lord went gently through. The butler desired to know if Mr. Carr would drink a glass of burgundy. He exhibited a dusty bottle. My lord considered it through his eyeglass and decided in favour. He sipped reflectively and waved the ham away. Sweetmeats appeared before him, and a soup, while plump pigeons were uncovered at his elbow. One was whipped deftly on to his plate, and as he took up his knife and fork to carve it, a great scuffling sounded without, angry voices being raised in expostulation, and, above all, a breathless, insistent appeal from Mr. Carr or Sir Miles. My lord laid down the knife and fork and came to his feet. "'It appears I am demanded,' he said, and went to the door. It was opened for him at once, and he stepped out into the hall to find Mr. Bullet, trying to dodge the younger footman, who was refusing to let him pass. At the sight of Carstairs, he stepped back respectfully. Mr. Bullet, hot, distraught, breathless, fell upon my lord. "'Thank God you are here, sir!' he cried. Carstairs observed him with some surprise. Mr. Bullet had been so very frigid when last they had met. "'I am glad to be at your service, sir,' he bowed. "'You have commands for me.' "'We are in terrible trouble,' almost moaned the other. "'Betty bade me to come and find you, or failing you, Sir Miles, for none other can help us.' Carstairs' glance grew sharper. "'Trouble? Not—but I forget my manners. 
We shall talk more at ease in here. He led Mr. Belay into the morning room. Belay thrust a paper into his hands. Diana went riding this afternoon, and only her horse returned, with this attached to the pommel. Read it, sir. Read it. Diana! Carstairs strode over to the light, and devoured the contents of the single sheet with eager eyes. They were not long, and they were very much to the point. Mr. Bulay may haply recall to mind a certain Mr. Everard, of Bath, whose addresses to Miss Bulay were cruelly repulsed. He regrets having now to take the matter into his own hands, and trusts to further his acquaintance with Mr. Bulay at some future date, when Miss Bulay shall, he trusts, have become Mrs. Everard. Jack crumpled the paper furiously in his hands, grinding out a startling oath. Insolent cur! Yes, yes, sir. But what will that avail my daughter? I have come straight to you, for my sister is convinced you know this Everard, and can tell me where to seek them. Carstairs clapped a hand on his shoulder. Never fear, Mr. Bulay. I pledge you my sword. She shall be found this very night. You know where he has taken her? You do? You are sure? Back to his earth, or lay my life, tis ever his custom. He strode to the door, flung it wide, and shot clear, crisp directions at the footman. See to it that my mare is settled in ten minutes, and blue devil harness to your master's curricle. Don't stand staring. Go, and send Salter to me. The footman scuttled away, pausing only to inform my lord that Salter was not in. Carstairs remembered that he had given Jim leave to visit his Mary at Fittering, and crushed out another oath. He sprang up the stairs, Mr. Belay following breathlessly. In his room, struggling with his boots, he put a few questions. Mr. Bulay related the whole tale, dwelling mournfully on the excellent references for Harper he had received from Sir Hugh Grandison. Jack hauled at his second boot. Tracy himself, of course. He fumed, adjusting his spurs. Pray, Mr. Carr, who is this scoundrel? Is it true that you know him? Andover, answered Jack from the depths of the guard rope. Damn the fellow! Where has he put my cloak? This to the absent Jim, and not the Duke. Andover! Not, surely not the Duke! cried Mr. Bulay. I know of no other, at last. He emerged and tossed a heavy many-caped coat on to the bed. Now, sir, your attention for one moment. He was buckling on his sword as he spoke, and not looking at the other man. Tracy will have born die, Miss Bulay, off to the Andover court, seven miles beyond Wincham, to the southwest. Your horse, I take it, is not fresh. He knew Mr. Bulay's horse. I have ordered the curricle for you. I will ride on at once by shortcuts, for there is not a moment to be lost. The Duke of Andover! interrupted Mr. Bulay. The Duke of Andover! Why do you think he purposes to marry my daughter? Jack gave a short, furious laugh. <laughs> Ay, as he married all the others. Mr. Bulay winced. Sir, pray why should you say so? I perceive you do not know his grace. Perchance you have heard of Devil Belmanoir. Then the little man paled. Good God! Mr. Carr, tis not he! Carstairs caught up his hat and whip. Ay, Mr. Bulay, tis indeed he. Now, perhaps, you appreciate the necessity for haste. Mr. Bulay's eyes were open at last. For God's sake, Mr. Carr, after them! Tis what I intend, sir. You will follow as swiftly as possible. Yes, yes, but do not wait for anything. Can you reach Andover in time? I reach Andover to-night, was the grim answer. And you, sir? You know the road. I will find out. Only go, Mr. Carr. Do not waste time, I implore you. Jack struggled into his riding coat, clapped his hat on to his head, and with his grace of Andover's sword tucked beneath his arm, went down the stairs three and four at a time, and hurried out on to the drive, where the groom stood waiting with Jenny's bridle over his arm. Carstairs cast a hasty glance at the girths and sprang up. The mare sidled and fidgeted, fretting to be gone, but was held in with a hand of iron while her master spoke to the groom. "'You must drive Mr. Bulay to Andover Court as fast as you can. It is a matter of life and death. You know the way.' The amazed groom collected his wits with difficulty. "'Roughly, sir.' "'That will do. Mr. Bulay will know. Drive your damnedest man. Sir Miles won't mind.' 
You understand? Jack's word was law in the O'Hara household. Yes, sir, answered the man and touched his hat. On the word he saw the beautiful straining mare leap forward, and the next moment both horse and rider were swallowed into the gloom. Well, I'm darned, exploded the groom and turned to fetch the curricle. Across the stretch of moorland went Jack at a gallop, Jenny speeding under him like the wind, and seeming to catch something of her master's excitement. Lo, over her neck he bent, holding the duke's sword across his saddle, bows with one hand and with the other guiding her, so he covered some three miles. He reined in then and forced her to a canter, saving her strength for the long distance ahead of them. She was in splendid condition, glorying in the unrestrained gallop across the turf, and although she was too well-mannered to pull on the rein, Carstairs could see by the eager twitching of her ears how she longed to be gone over the ground. He spoke soothingly to her, and guided her on to the very lane where Diana had ridden that afternoon. She fell into a long, easy stride that seemed to eat up the ground. Now they were off the lane, riding over a field to join another road leading west. A hedge cut them off, but the mare gathered her legs beneath her and soared over, alighting as gracefully as a bird and skimming on again up the road. Her responsive ears flickered as he praised her and pulled her up. "'Easy now, Jenny, easy!' She was trembling with excitement, but she yielded to his will and trotted quietly for perhaps another half-hour. Carstairs rose and fell rhythmically in the saddle, taking care to keep his spurred heels from her glossy sides. He guessed the time to be about seven o'clock, and his brows drew together worriedly. Jenny was made of steel and lightning, but would she manage it? He had never tested her powers as he was about to now, and he dared not allow her much breathing space. Every minute was precious if he were to reach Andover before it was too late. Assuming that Tracy had captured Diana at four, or thereabouts, he reckoned that it should take a heavy coach four hours or more to reach Andover. Jenny might manage it in two and a half hours, allowing for short cuts, in which case he ought to arrive not long after the others. He was tortured by the thought of Diana at the mercy of a man of Tracy's calibre. Diana in terror, Diana despairing, Unconsciously he pressed his knees against the smooth flank, and once again Jenny fell into that long, swift stride. She seemed to glide over the ground with never a jar nor a stumble. Carstairs was careful not to irk her in any way, only keeping a guiding, restraining hand on the rein, and for the rest letting her go as she willed. On and on they sped, as the time lagged by, sometimes through leafy lanes, at others over fields and rough tracks, not for nothing had Carstairs roamed this country for two years. Almost every path was familiar to him. He never took a wrong turn, never swerved, never hesitated. On and on, past sleeping villages and lonely homesteads, skirting woods, riding up hill and down dale, never slackening his hold on the rein, never taking his eyes off the road before him, except now and then to throw a glance to the side on the lookout for some hidden by-path. After the first hour, a dull pain in his shoulder reminded him of his wound. Still troublesome, he set his teeth and pressed on still faster. The mare caught her foot on a loose stone and stumbled. His hand held her together, the muscles standing out like ribbed steel. His voice encouraged her, and he made her walk again. This time she did not fret against the restraint. He shifted the sword under his bridle hand and passed the right down her steaming neck, crooning to her softly beneath his breath. She answered with a low, throbbing whinny. She could not understand why he desired her to gallop on, braving unknown terrors in the dark. All she could know was that it was his wish. It seemed also that he was pleased with her. She would have cantered on again, but he made her walk for perhaps another five minutes, until they were come to a stretch of common he knew well. It was getting late, and he pressed her with his knee, adjuring her to do her best, and urging her to gallop, leaning right forward, the better to pierce the darkness ahead. A gorse bush loomed before them, and Jenny shied at it, redoubling her pace. With hand and voice he soothed her, and on they sped. He judged the time to be now about half-past eight, and knew that they must make the remaining miles in an hour. Even now the coach might have arrived, and beyond that he dared not think. Another half-hour crept by, and he could feel the mare's breath coming short and fast, and reined in again, this time to a canter. He was off the moor now, on a road he remembered well, and knew himself to be not ten miles from Wincham. 
five more miles as the crow flies. He knew he must give Jenny another rest, and pulled up, dismounting and going to her head. Her legs were trembling, and the sweat rolled off her satin skin. She dropped her nose into his hand, sobbingly. He rubbed her ears and patted her, and she lipped his cheek lovingly, breathing more easily. Up again, then, and forward once more, skimming over the ground. Leaving Wincham on his right, Carstairs cut west and then northwest on the high road now, leading to Andover. Only two more miles to go. Jenny stumbled again and broke into a walk. Her master tapped her shoulder, and she picked up her stride again. She was almost winded, and he knew it, but he had to force her onwards. She responded gallantly to his hand, although her breath came sobbingly, and her great soft eyes were blurred. At last the great iron gates were in view. He could see them through the dusk, firmly shut. He pulled up and walked on, looking for a place in the hedge where Jenny might push through. End of chapter 26 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, September 2011「Discreetly closing the door behind them, she affected to eat a peach, skinning it with her fingers, that were stiff and wooden. Tracy leaned back in his chair, surveying her through half-shut eyelids. He watched her eat her peach, and rise to her feet, standing with her hand on the back of the high-carved chair. She addressed him nervously, and with would-be lightness. "'Well, sir, I have eaten, and I protest I am fatigued. Pray have the goodness to conduct me to your housekeeper.' "'My dear,' he drawled, "'nothing would give me greater pleasure, always supposing that I possessed one.' She raised her eyebrows haughtily. "'I presume you have at least a maidservant?' she inquired. "'If I am to remain here, I would retire.' "'You shall, child, all in good time. But do not be in a hurry to deprive me of your fair company.' He rose as he spoke and taking her hand, led her dumbly to a low-backed settee at the other end of the great room. "'If you have aught to say to me, Your Grace, I beg that you will reserve it until to-morrow. I am not in the humour to-night.' He laughed at her. "'Still so cold, child. I am not like to be different, sir.' His eyes glinted. "'You think so? I shall show you that you are wrong, my dear. You may loathe me. You may love me. But I think you will lose something of that icy indifference. Allow me to point out to you that there is a couch behind you. I perceive it, sir. Then be seated. It is not worth the while, sir. I am not staying. He advanced one step towards her with that in his face that made her sink hurriedly on to the couch. He nodded, smiling. You are wise, Diana. Why so free with my name, sir? This with icy sweetness. Tracy flung himself down beside her, his arm over the back of the settee, and the fingers of his drooping hand just touching her shoulder. It was all the girl could do to keep from screaming. She felt trapped and helpless, and her nerve was in pieces. "'Nice, sweet. An end to this quibbling. Bethink you, it is worth your while to anger me.' She sat rigid and silent. "'I love you. Ah, you shudder. One day you will not do that. You call this love, your grace? She cried out between scorn and misery. Something near it, he answered imperturbably. God help you, then, she shivered, thinking of one other who had loved her so differently. Be like he will, was the pleasant rejoinder. But we wander from the point. It is this. You shall retire to your chamber at once, sir, uh, armed with the key, and you will swear to marry me to-morrow. Very white, she made as if to rise. The thin fingers closed over her shoulders, forcing her to remain. No, my dear, sit still. Her self-control was slipping away from her. She struggled to be free of that hateful hand. 
Oh, you brute! You brute! Let me go! When you've given me your answer, sweetheart— It is no! she cried. A thousand times no! Think? I have thought. I would rather die than wed you. Very possibly. But death will not be your lot, my pretty one, purred the sinister voice in her ear. Think carefully before you answer. Were it not better to marry me with all honour than to— You devil! She panted, and looked wildly round for some means of escape. The long window was open, she knew, for the curtain blew out into the room, but his grace was between it and her. You begin to think better of it, child. Remember, to-morrow will be too late. This is your chance. Now, in truth. He took a pinch of snuff. In truth, it matters not to me whether you will be a bride or no. With a sudden movement, she wrenched herself free and darted to the window. In a flash, he was up, and had caught her as she reached it, swinging around to face him. Not so fast, my dear. You do not escape me so. His arm was about her waist, drawing her irresistibly towards him. Sick with fear, she struck madly at the face bent close to hers. "'Let me go! How dare you insult me so! Oh, for God's sake, let me go!' He was pressing her, against him, one hand holding her wrists behind her in a grip of iron, his other arm about her shoulders. "'For my sake, I shall keep you,' he smiled, and looked gloatingly down at her beautiful, agonized countenance, with its wonderful eyes gazing imploringly at him, and the sensitive mouth a-quiver. For one instant he held her so, and then swiftly bent his head and pressed his lips to hers. She could neither struggle nor cry out. A deadly faintness assailed her, and she could scarcely breathe. "'By God, it is too late,' he swore. "'You had best give in, madam. Naught can avail you now.' And then the unexpected happened. Even as in her last desperate effort to free herself she moaned the name of him whom she deemed hundreds of miles away across the sea— a crisp voice vibrating with a species of cold fury sounded directly behind them. "'You delude yourself, Belmanoir,' it said with deadly quiet. With an oath, Tracy released the girl and wheeled to face the intruder. Framed by the dark curtains, drawn sword in hand, murder in his blue eyes, stood my lord. Tracy's snarl died slowly, as he stared, and a look of blank amazement took its place. Diana, almost unable to believe her eyes, dizzy with the suddenness of it all, stumbled blindly towards him, crying, "'Thank God! Thank God! Oh, Jack!' He caught her in his arms, drawing her gently to the couch. "'Dear heart, you never doubted I should come?' "'I thought you in France!' she sobbed, and sank down amongst the cushions. Carstairs turned to meet his grace. Tracy had recovered from the first shock of surprise, and was eyeing him through his quizzing glass. "'This is an unexpected pleasure, my lord,' he drawled with easy insolence. Diana started at the mode of address, and looked up at Carstairs, bewildered. "'I perceive your sword in the corner behind you, your grace,' snapped Jack, and flung over to the door, twisting the key round in the lock and slipping it into his breeches pocket. To Diana he was as a stranger, with no laugh in the glittering blue eyes, and none of the almost finicking politeness that usually characterized his bearing. He was very white, with lips set in a hard, straight line, and his nostrils slightly expanded. His grace shrugged a careless refusal. "'My dear Carstairs, why should I fight you?' he inquired, seemingly not in the least annoyed by the other's intrusion. "'I had anticipated that answer, Your Grace. So I brought this.' As he spoke, Jack drove the sword he held into the wood floor, where it stayed, quivering. Nonchalantly, Tracy took it in his hand and glanced at the hilt. His fingers tightened on it convulsingly, and he shot a piercing glance at Jack. "'I am entirely at your service,' he said very smoothly, and laid the sword on the table. Some of the glare died out of my lord's eyes, and a little triumphant smile curved the corners of his mouth. Quickly he divested himself of his fine velvet coat, his waistcoat and his scabbard, and pulled off the heavy riding boots— caked with mud. He proceeded to tuck up his ruffles, awaiting his grace's convenience. As one in a dream, Diana saw the table pushed back, the paces measured, and heard the ring of steel against steel. My lord opened the attack after a few moments' cautious circling, lunging swiftly and recovering, even as the duke countered and delivered a lightning repoistacant. 
My lord parried gracefully in tears, and chuckled softly to himself. With parted lips and wide eyes, the girl on the couch watched each fresh lunge. A dozen times it seemed as though Carstairs must be run through, but each time, by some miraculous means, he regained his position, and the Duke's blade met steel. Once, indeed, thrusting in quote, Tracy's point aimed too high, flashed above the other's guard, and ripped the cambric shirt at the sleeve. My lord retired his foot nimbly, parried, and reposted with a straight thrust, wrist held high before Tracy could recover his opposition. The blades clashed, as Forte met Foible, and my lord lunged straight at his opponent's breast. Diana shut her eyes, expecting every moment to hear the dull thud of Tracy's body as it should fall to the ground. It did not come, but instead there sounded a confused stamping and scraping of blades, and she looked again to find the duke disengaging over my lord's supple wrist and being parried with the utmost ease and dexterity. Carstairs knew that he would not be able to last long, however. His shoulder, fretted by the long ride, was aching intolerably, and his wrist seemed to have lost some of its cunning. He was conscious of a singing in his head which he tried in vain to ignore, but his eyes glowed and sparkled with the light of battle and the primitive lust to kill. The Duke was fencing with almost superhuman skill, moving heavily and deliberately, seemingly tireless. Carstairs, on the other hand, was as swift and light as a panther, grace in every turn of his slim body. He fainted suddenly inside the arm, deceiving the parade of tears. His grace fell back a pace, parrying in quart, and as John, with a quick twist, changed to quart also, and the blades crossed, Tracy lunged forward the length of his arm, and a deep red splash stained the whiteness of my lord's sleeve at the shoulder. Diana gave a choked cry, knowing it to be the old wound, and the duke's blade came to rest upon the ground. "'You are satisfied?' he asked coolly but panting a little. My lord reeled slightly, controlled himself, and brushed his left hand across his eyes. "'On God!' was all he replied, ignoring a pleading murmur from the girl. Tracy shrugged, meeting Carstairs' blade with his, and the fight went on. Tracy's eyes were almost shut. It appeared to Diana, his chin thrust forward, his teeth gripping the thin lower lip. To her horror, she saw that Carstairs was breathing in gasps, and that his face was ashen in hue. It was torture to her to sit impotent, but she held herself in readiness to fly to his rescue should the need arise. Suddenly my lord fainted on both sides of the arm and ripped open the duke's sleeve, causing a steady trickle of blood to drip down on to the floor. Tracy took no notice, but countered so deftly that John's blade wavered and he staggered back. For an instant it seemed as though the end had come, but somehow he steadied himself, recovering his guard. Diana was on her feet now nearly as wide as her lover, her hands pressed to her breast. She saw that John's point was no longer so purposeful, and the smile had gone from his lips. They were parted now, the upper one rigid, and a deep furrow cut into his brow. Then, startling in the stillness of the great house, came the clanging of a bell, pulled with some violence. Carstairs' white lips moved soundlessly, and Diana, guessing it to be her father, moved, clinging to the wall towards the door. A moment later, along the passage, came the sound of steps. A gay, boisterous voice was raised, followed by a deeper, graver one. His grace's face became devilish in its expression, but Carstairs took no notice, seeming not to hear. Only he thrust with such skill that his grace was forced to fall back a pace. The loud voices demanded to know what was toward in the locked room, and Diana, knowing that my lord was nearly spent, beat upon the panels. "'Quickly, quickly!' she cried. "'Break through! For heaven's sake, whoever you are, tis locked!' "'Good God! Tis a woman!' exclaimed the voice. "'Listen, Dick. Why, why, tis a fight!' "'Oh, be quick!' implored Diana. And then came the deeper voice. "'Stand away, madam. We will burst the lock.' She moved quickly aside, turning her attention once more to the duel by the window as Andrew flung his shoulder against the stout wood. At the third blow the lock gave— the door flew wide, and Lord Andrew was precipitated into the room, and the two by the window fought on unheeding, faster and faster. "'Well, I'll be damned,' said Andrew, surveying them. He walked forward interestedly, and at the same moment caught sight of Jack's face. He stared in amazement and called to Richard. "'Good Lord! Here, Dick! Come here! Surely it's—' "'Who is that man?' Diana saw the tall gentleman, so like her lover in appearance, step forward to the young rake's side. The next events happened in a flash. She heard a great cry, and before she had time to know what he was doing, 
Richard had whipped his sword from its scabbard and had struck up the two blades. In that moment the years rolled back, and recognizing his brother, Jack gasped furiously, "'Damn you, Dick! Out of the way!' Tracy stood leaning on his sword, watching, his breath coming in gasps, but still with that cynical smile on his lips. Richard, seeing that his brother would fly at the Duke again, closed with him, struggling to wrest the rapier from his weakened grasp. "'You fool, John! Leave go! Leave go, I say!' With a twist he had the sword in his hand, and sent it spinning across the room, as without a sound my lord crumpled up and fell with a thud to the floor. End of chapter 27 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, September 2011Chapter 28 of The Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. The Black Moth by Georgette Hare. Chapter 28. In which what threatened to be tragedy turns to comedy. With a smothered cry, Diana flew across the room to where my lord lay in a pitiful little heap, but before her was Richard. He fell on his knees beside the still figure, feeling for the wound. Diana, on the other side, looked across at him. "'Tis his shoulder, sir, an old wound. Oh, he is not. He cannot be dead. Richard shook his head dumbly, and gently laid bare the white shoulder. The wound was bleeding very slightly, and they bound it deftly betwixt them, with their united handkerchiefs and a napkin seized from the table. "'Tis exhaustion, I take it,' frowned Richard, his hand before the pale lips. "'He is breathing still.' Over her shoulder Diana shot an order. "'One of you men, please, fetch water and cognac.' "'At once, madame,' responded Andrew promptly, and hurried out. She bent once more over my lord, gazing anxiously into his face. "'He will live. You are sure. He... He must have rid all the way from Maltby for me. She caught her breath on a sob, pressing one lifeless hand to her lips. For you, madam. Richard looked an inquiry. She blushed. Yes, he, we, I. I see, said Richard gravely. She nodded. Yes, and, and the Duke caught me and brought me here, and, and then he came and saved me. The air blowing in from the window stirred the ruffles of my lord's shirt, and blew a strand of her dark hair across Diana's face. She caught it back and stared at Richard with a puzzled air. "'Pardon me, sir, but you are so like him.' "'I am his brother,' answered Richard shortly. Her eyes grew round with surprise. "'His brother, sir? I never knew Mr. Carr had a brother. Mr. Who?' asked Richard. "'Carr. It is not his name, is it?' I heard the Duke call him Carstairs, and my lord. He is the Earl of Wincham, answered Richard, stretching out a hand to relieve Andrew of the jug of water he was proffering. Good gracious, gasped Diana, but, but he said he was a highwayman. Quite true, madame. True? But how, how ridiculous! And how like him! She soaked a handkerchief in the water and bathed my lord's forehead. "'He is not coming to in the least,' she said nervously. "'You are sure tis not—not—' not... "'Quite. He'll come round presently. "'You said he had ridden far.' "'He must have, sir. I wish he were not so pale. "'He was staying with the O'Haras at Maltby.' "'What? The O'Haras?' "'Yes, and he must have ridden from there, and his wound still so tender.' Again she kissed the limp hand. Over by the window his grace— his breath recovered, was eyeing Andrew through his quizzing glass. "'May I inquire what brings you here?' he asked sweetly. "'And why you saw fit to bring the saintly Richard?' "'I came because it suited me to do so. I never dreamed you were here. Pwn my soul, I did not.' "'Where, then, did you think I was?' "'Never thought about you at all, my dear fellow. I'm not your squire.' "'Why is Richard here?' "'Lord, what a catechism!' He is here because he brought me with him on his way to Wincham. Have you any objection? It would be useless, shrugged Tracy. Have I killed that young fool? Andrew looked him over in disgust. No, you have not. 
You have barely touched him, thanks be. Dear me, why this sudden affection for Carstairs? Andrew swung round on his heel, remarking over his shoulder, He may be a cheat, but he's a damned fine fellow. By gad, he nearly pinked you as I entered. <laughs> he chuckled at the memory of that glorious moment. He nearly pinked me a dozen times, replied Tracy, binding his arm round more tightly. He fights like ten devils, but he was fatigued. He followed Andrew across the room and stood looking down at his unconscious foe. Diana's eyes challenged him. "'Stand back, Your Grace. You have no more to do here.' He drew out his snuff-box and took a pinch. "'So, that is how the matter lies, my dear. I did not know that. You pretend that it would have made a difference in your treatment of me.' "'Not the slightest, child,' he replied, shedding the box with a snap. "'It has merely come as a slight surprise to me. It seems he has the luck this round.' He walked away again as another great bell peal sounded through the house. Andrew, pouring cognac into a glass, paused with the bottle held in midair. "'Thunder and turf! We are like to be a party. Who now?' He set the glass down and lounged out of the room, bottle in hand. They heard him give an astonished cry and a loud laugh, and the next moment O'Hara strode into the room, booted and spurred and enveloped in a heavy surcoat. He came swiftly upon the little group about my lord, and went down on one knee beside him. His eyes seemed to take in every one at a glance. Then he looked across at Richard. "'Is he alive?' Richard nodded, not meeting the hard, anxious gaze. O'Hara bent over his friend. "'He has been wounded?' Diana answered this. "'Only slightly, Sir Miles. But twas his shoulder again. He was tired, after the ride. Mr. Carstairs thinks he has fainted from exhaustion.' O'Hara very gently slipped one arm beneath my lord's shoulders, and the other under his knees, rising with him as easily as if he were carrying a baby. He walked over to the couch, lowering his burden onto the cushions that Diana placed to receive him. "'He will be easier there,' he said, and looked across at her. "'You're safe, child.' "'Quite, quite. He came just in time, and fought for me.' She dabbed openly at her eyes. "'I—I I love him so, Sir Miles.' "'And now I hear that he is an earl.' <sighs> she sighed. "'Well, child, it will make no difference, I take it. "'I hope he'll make ye happy.' "'She smiled through her tears very confidently. "'O'Hara turned and faced Richard, "'who was standing a little in the rear, watching his brother's face. "'He meant O'Hara's scathing look squarely. "'Well?' "'Not,' answered the Irishman cuttingly, "'and walked over to where Lord Andrew was arguing hotly with his brother.' Carstairs returned to my lord's side and stood looking silently down at him. Diana suddenly gave a little joyful cry. "'He is coming round. He moved his head. Oh, Jack, my dear one, look at me!' She bent over him with eyes alight with love. My lord's eyes flickered and opened. For a moment he stared at her. "'Why, Diana!' She took his head between her hands and kissed him full on the mouth. Then she raised his head to look into the blue eyes. My lord's arm crept round her and held her tight against him. After a moment she disengaged herself and stood aside. Jack's eyes, still a little bewildered, fell upon his brother. He struggled upon his elbow. "'Am I dreaming?' "'Dick!' His voice was full of great joy. Richard bent quickly to him, trying to put him back on the cushions. "'My dear Jack, no, no, lie still!' "'Lie still!' cried my lord, swinging his feet to the ground. "'Not a bit of it. I am well enough, but a trifle dizzy. How in thunder did you come here?' Surely it was you knocked up my sword, yes? Interfering young cub, give me your arm a minute. But why do you want to get up? pleaded a soft voice in his ear. So that I can take you in my arms, sweetheart. He answered and proceeded to do so. Then his glance, wandering round the room, alighted on the heated group by the table. Andrew, vociferously indignant, Tracy, coolly sarcastic, and O'Hara, furious. Dare an ounce, ejaculated my lord. "'Where did they all spring from?' "'I don't know,' <laughs> laughed Diana. "'Sir Miles came a few minutes ago. "'The other gentleman came with Mr. Carstairs.' "'Ay, I remember him. "'Tis Andrew, eh, Dick? "'Zounds how he's grown! "'But what in the world are they all fighting over? "'Miles! "'Miles, I say!' "'O'Hara wheeled around surprised. "'Oh-ho! "'Ye are up, are ye?' "'He crossed to his side. "'Then sit down!' "'Since you are all so insolent, I will.' "'How did you come here?' 
O'Hara went round to the back of the couch to arrange a cushion beneath the hurt shoulder, and leaned his arms upon the back, looking down with a laugh in his eyes. "'Faith, I roared. "'But how did you know? Where?' "'Twas all on account of that young rascal, David,' he said. "'Molly fretted and fumed all the way to the Frasers, vowing the child would be neglected and what not, and we'd not been in the house above an hour or so, when up she jumps and says she knows that something has happened at home, and nothing will suffice, but that I must drive her back. We arrived just as Billet was setting out. He told us the whole tale, and of course I had Blue Peter saddled in the twinkling of an eye, and was off after ye. But what with taking the wrong turns in me horse not happening to be made a lightning, I couldn't arrive until now. You cannot have been so long after me, said Jack, for I wasted full half an hour outside here, trying to find an opening in the hedge for Jenny to get through. She is now stalled in a shed at the bottom of the lawn with my cloak over her. I'll swear she's thirsty, too. I'll see to that, promised O'Hara. Andrew came across the room and bowed awkwardly to my lord, stammering a little. Carstairs held out his hand. Lord, Andy, I scarce knew you. After a moment's hesitation, Andrew took the outstretched hand and answered laughingly. But my lord had not failed to notice the hesitation, short though it had been. "'I beg your pardon. I had forgot,' he said stiffly. Andrew sat down beside him rather red about the ears. "'Oh, stuff, Jack! I'm a clumsy fool, but I did not mean that.' Richard stepped forward into the full light of the candles. "'If you will all listen to me one moment, I shall be greatly obliged,' he said steadily. Lord John started forward. "'Dick!' he cried warningly, and would have gone to him, but for O'Hara's hand on his shoulder dragging him back. "'Ah, now, be easy,' growled Miles. "'Let the man say it. Hold your tongue, O'Hara. Dick, wait one moment. I want to speak to you.' Richard never glanced at him. "'I am about to tell you something that should have been told seven years ago. Once and for all, I forbid it!' snapped my lord, trying to disengage himself from O'Hara's grip. Miles leant over him. "'See here, me boy. If ye don't keep a still tongue in your head, it's meself that'll be gagging ye. And that's that.' My lord swore at him. Diana laid a gentle hand on his arm. "'Please, John, please be still. Why should not Mr. Carstairs speak?' "'You don't know what he would do,' fumed Jack. "'In fact, Miss Bullet, Sir Miles and Andrew are completely in the dark,' drawled the Duke. "'Shall I tell the tale, Richard?' "'Thank you. I shall not require your assistance,' was the cold rejoinder. "'But I must ask you to be quiet, John.' "'I will not. You must not—' "'That will do,' decided O'Hara, and placed a relentless hand over his mouth. "'Go on, Carstairs. "'For the sake of Miss Bullet, I will tell you that seven years ago my brother and I went to a card party. I cheated. He took the blame. He has borne it ever since because I was too much of a coward to confess.' "'That is all I have to say.' "'Twas for that you wanted to see me on Friday,' shot out O'Hara. Richard nodded dully. "'Yes, I was going to tell you then. Hm. I'm glad you had decided to play the man's part for once.' With a furious oath, Jack wrenched himself free and rounded on his friend. "'You take too much upon yourself, O'Hara.' He rose unsteadily and walked to Richard's side. "'Dick has told you much, but not all.' You, none of you, know the reasons we had for acting as we did. But you know him well enough to believe that it needed very strong reasons to induce him to allow me to take the blame. If any one has aught to say in the matter, I shall be glad if he will say it to me now. His eyes flashed menacingly as they swept the company, and rested for an instant on O'Hara's unyielding countenance. Then he turned and held out his hand to his brother with his own peculiarly wistful smile. "'Can you bear to speak to me?' muttered Richard, with face averted. "'God, Dick, don't be ridiculous!' He grasped the unwilling hand. "'You would have done the same for me.' Andrew pressed forward. "'Well, I can see no use in raking up whole scores. After all, what does it matter? It's buried and finished. Here's my hand on it, Dick. Lord, I couldn't turn my back on the man I've lived on for years.' He laughed irrepressibly and wrung Richard's hand. My lord's eyes were on O'Hara, pleading. Reluctantly, the Irishman came forward. "'Tis only fair to tell you, Richard.' that I can't see eye to eye with Andrew here. However, I'm not denying that I think a good deal better of ye now that I did seven years ago. Richard looked up eagerly. You never believed him guilty? 
O'Hara laughed. <laughs> Hardly. You knew twas I. I had me suspicions, of course. I wish, oh, how I wish you had voiced them. O'Hara raised his eyebrows, and there fell a little silence. His grace of Andover broke it, coming forward in his inimitable way. He looked around the room at each member of the company. One, two, three, four, five. He counted. Andrew, tell them to lay covers for five in the dining room. Aren't you staying? asked his brother, surprised. I have supped, replied Tracy coolly. For a moment O'Hara's mouth twitched, and then he burst out laughing. Everyone looked at him inquiringly. He called, he gasped. Oh, sink me, and I ever came across a more amusing villain. Lay covers for five, oh, Tom. Or should I have said six? Continued his grace imperturbably. Am I not to have the honour of Mr. Bulet's company? O'Hara checked his mirth. No, ye are not. He was content to let me manage the business, and went back to Little Dean. I am sorry, bowed his grace, and turned to my lord, who with his arm about Diana's waist was watching him arrogantly. I see how the land lies, he remarked. I congratulate you, John. I cannot help wishing that I had finished you that day in the road. Permit me to say that you fence rather creditably. My lord bowed stiffly. And of course, continued his grace smoothly, you also wish you had disposed of me. I sympathize. But however much you may inwardly despise and loathe me, you cannot show it unless you choose to make yourself and me the talk of town, not forgetting Mistress Diana. Also I abhor bad tragedy. So I trust you will remain here to-night as my guest. Uh, Andrew, pray do not omit to order bedchambers to be prepared. Afterwards you need never come near me again. In fact, I hope that you will not. My lord could not entirely repress a smile. I thank you, your grace, for your hospitality, which I fear— he glanced down at Diana's tired face. I shall be compelled to accept. As to the rest, I agree, like you. I dislike bad tragedy. Diana gave a tiny laugh. You are all so stiff, she said. I shall go to bed. I will take you to the stairs, then, said Jack promptly, and led her forward. She stopped as they were about to pass his grace and faced him. Tracy bowed very low. Good night, madame. Carstairs will know which room I had assigned to you. You will find a servant there. Thank you, she said steadily. I shall try to forget the happenings of this day, Your Grace. I see the truth in what you say. We cannot afford to let the world see that we are at enmity, lest it should talk. And I confess it freely. I find it less hard to forgive you the insults of today, since they brought Jack to me, and I had not been in such dire straits. I might never have seen him again. In fact, bowed his grace, everything has been for the best. I would not say that, sir, she replied, and went out. For a moment there was silence in the room. No one quite knew what to say. As usual, it was Tracy who came to the rescue, breaking an uncomfortable pause. Now I suggest that we adjourn to the dining-room, he said. I gather we may have to wait some time before his lordship reappears. O'Hara! "'After you. One moment,' replied Miles. "'Jack's mare is in a shed somewhere. I said I would see to her.' "'Andrew,' called his grace, "'when you have finished superintending the laying of the supper, "'give orders concerning Carstairs' mare.' A casual assent came from outside, and immediately afterwards Lord Andrew's voice was heard shouting instructions to someone, evidently some way off. On the whole, the supper party passed off quite smoothly, his grace was smilingly urbane, Andrew boisterous and amusing, and O'Hara bent on keeping the conversation up. Richard sat rather silent, but my lord, already deliriously happy, soon let fall his amour, and joined in the talk, anxious to hear all the news of town for the last six years. O'Hara was several times hard put to it to keep from laughing out loud at his thoughts. The humour of the situation struck him forcibly. After fighting as grimly as these men fought, and after all that had transpired, that they should both sit down to supper as they were doing, appealed to him strongly. He had quite thought that my lord would incline to tragedy, and refuse to stay an instant longer in the duke's house. It was not until midnight, when everyone else had gone to bed, that the brothers came face to face alone. 
The dining-room was very quiet now, and the table bore a dissipated look with the remains of a supper left on it. My lord stood absently playing with the long-handled punch-spoon, idly stirring the golden dregs at the bottom of the bowl. The candles shed their light full on his face, and Richard, standing opposite in the shadow, had ample opportunity of studying it. It seemed to him that he could not look long enough. Unconsciously his eyes devoured every detail of the loved countenance and watched each movement of the slender hand. He found John subtly changed, but quite how he could not define. He had not aged much, and he was still the same laughter-loving Jack of the old days, with just that intangible difference. O'Hara had felt it, too, a slight impenetrability, a reserve. It was my lord who broke the uncomfortable silence, as if he felt the other's eyes upon him. He looked up with his appealing, whimsical smile. "'Devil take it, Dick. We're as shy as two schoolboys.' Richard did not smile, and his brother came round the table to his side. "'There's naught to be said betwixt us two, Dick. T'would be so damned unnecessary, after all. We always shared in one another's scrapes.' He stood a moment with his hand on Richard's shoulder. Then Richard turned to him. "'What you must think of me!' he burst out. "'My God, when I realize, I know, believe me, Dick, I know just what you must have felt. But pray forget it. It's over now, and buried.' There was another long silence. Lord John withdrew his hand at last and perched on the edge of the table, smiling across at Richard. "'I'd well nigh forgot that you were a middle-aged pauper, a son. I, John, after you. I protest I am flattered.' "'Lord, to think of you with a boy of your own,' he laughed, twirling his eyeglass. At last Richard smiled. "'To think of you, an uncle,' he retorted. And suddenly all vestige of stiffness had fled. Next morning Richard went on to Wincham and Diana. Jack and O'Hara travelled back to Sussex. Jack would not go home yet. He protested that he was going to be married first, and would then bring home his countess but he had several instructions to give his brother concerning the preparation of his house. The last thing he requested Richard do was to seek out a certain city merchant, Fudby by name, and to rescue a clerk, Chilter, from him, bearing him off to Wincham. All this he called from the coach window, just before they set off. Richard led Jenny, whom he was to ride home, up to the door of the vehicle, and expostulated. "'But what in thunder am I to do with the man?' "'Give him to Warburton.' advised Jack flippantly. I know he needs a clerk. He always did. But perhaps he will not desire to come. You do as I tell you, laughed his brother. I shall expect to find him at Wincham when I arrive. Au revoir. He drew his head in, and the coach rumbled off. End of chapter 28 Recorded by Tara Mendoza, Phoenix, Arizona, September 2011《Lady O'Hara arose, not a whit refreshed, and considerably more ill at ease than she had been before. During the night she had imagined all sorts of impossible horrors to have befallen her husband, and if when the reassuring daylight had come the horrors had somewhat dispersed, enough remained to cause her an anxious morning as she alternated between the hall window and the gate. No less worried was Jim Salter. He had returned from Fittering last night to find his master and Sir Miles gone. Lady O'Hara in a state of frightened bewilderment and the house in a whirl. No one, least of all poor Molly, seemed to know exactly where the two men had gone. All she knew was that they had come back upon a scene of turmoil, with Mr. Bullet in the midst of a small crowd of excited servants. Her husband had elbowed his way through, and into his ears had Mr. Bullet poured his story. Then O'Hara seemed to catch the excitement, and she had been hurried into the house with the hasty explanation that Jack was off after Devil who had caught Diana, and he must to the rescue. Ten minutes after, she had an alarming vision of him galloping off down the drive, 
his sword at his side, and pistols in the saddle holsters. The poor little lady had sent an imploring cry after him, checked almost before it had left her lips. Afterwards she had wished it had never been uttered, and rather hoped that it had escaped O'Hara's ears. Salter arrived not half an hour later, and his feelings when told that his beloved master had ridden off in search of a fight may be more easily imagined than described. He was all for setting out in his wake, but her ladyship strongly vetoed the plan, declaring that Sir Miles would be rescue enough, and she was not going to be left entirely without protectors. Jim was far too respectful to point out that there were five able-bodied men, not counting himself, in the house. But, as his master had left no instructions for him, he capitulated. He proved not, but a Job's comforter next day, for when my lady pessimistically premised that both Carstairs and her husband were undoubtedly hurt, he did not, as she expected he would, strive to reassure her, but gave a gloomy assent, whereupon she cast an indignant glance in his direction and turned her back. At four in the afternoon they were both in the hall, anxiously watching the drive. "'To be sure, tis monstrous late,' remarked Molly, with wide, apprehensive eyes. "'Yes, my lady.' "'If if not were miss, they should have been back by now, surely. "'Yes, indeed, my lady.' Lady O'Hara stamped her foot. "'Don't say yes!' she cried. Jim was startled. "'I beg pardon, my lady.' "'You are not to say yes. After all, they may have gone a long way. They are—they uh, they may be tired. Jenny may have gone lame. Anything, anything may have happened. Yes, ma I mean certainly, your ladyship, hastily amended Jim. In fact, I should not be surprised, and they were not at all hurt. He shook his head despondently, but luckily for him, the lady failed to notice it, and continued with airy cheerfulness for my husband has often told me what an excellent swordsman Mr. Carstairs is, and your ladyship forgets his wound. What she might have been constrained to reply to this is not known, for at that moment came the sound of coach-wheels on the gravel. With one accord she and Salter flew to the door, and between them wrenched it open, just as a gentleman's travelling-coach, postilioned by men in gold and black, and emblazoned with the Wincham arms, drew up at the door. My lady was down the steps in the twinkling of an eye, almost before one of the grooms had opened the door to offer an arm to my lord. Carstairs sprang lightly out, followed by O'Hara, seemingly none the worse for wear. Molly ran straight into her husband's arms, regardless of the servants hugging him. Jim Salter hurried up to my lord. "'You're not hurt, sir,' he cried. Carstairs handed him his hat and cloak. "'Not to speak of, Jim, but Everard. "'Well, now I finished me for all that.' He laughed at Jim's face of horror, and turned to Molly, who, having satisfied herself that her husband was quite uninjured, and had never once been in danger of his life, had come towards him, full of solicitude for his shoulder. "'Oh, my dear Jack, Miles tells me you have hurt your poor shoulder again, and pray what has been done for it. I dare swear not one of you great men had the wit to summon a doctor, as indeed you should have, for—' "'Wished now is Thor adjured her husband. "'Tis but a clean scratch, after all. Take him into the house, and give him something to drink. I swear tis what he needs most.' Molly pouted, laughed, and complied. Over the ale, Jack related the whole escapade up to the moment when he had parted from Diana at Little Dean. Then O'Hara took up the tale with a delightful chuckle. "'Sure, Molly, you never saw anything to equal poor old Bulet when his daughter had told him Jack's name. Faith, he didn't know what to do at all. He was so excited, and Miss Betty, I thought, would have the vapours from the way she flew from die to Jack and back again, in such a state of mind as you can't imagine. Molly, who had listened with round eyes, drew a deep ecstatic breath. Then she bounced up, clapping her hands, and proclaimed that she was right after all. What will you be meaning, Alona? inquired O'Hara. "'Pray, sir, did I not say over and over again that if I could only induce Jack to stay with us, everything would come right? Now, Miles, you know I did.' "'I remember you saying something like it once,' admitted her spouse. "'Once, indeed. I was always sure of it. And I did coax you to stay, did I not, Jack?' she appealed. "'You did,' he agreed. "'You assured me that if I was churlish enough to leave—' 
Miles would slowly sicken and pine away. She ignored her husband's ribald appreciation of this. "'Then you see that tis all owing to me that—' She broke off to shake O'Hara, and the meeting ended in riotous hilarity. When he went to change his clothes, Carstairs found Jim already in his room awaiting him. He hailed him gaily and sat down before his dressing-table. "'I require a very festive costume to-night, Jim. Rose velvet and cream brocade, I think.' "'Very good, your lordship,' was the prim reply. Jack slewed round. "'What's that?' "'I understand your lordship is an earl,' said poor Jim. "'Now, who was the tactless idiot who told you that? I had intended to break the news myself. I suppose now you know my story?' "'Yes, sir, uh, my lord. I, I suppose you won't be requiring my services any longer?' "'In heaven's name, why not? Do you wish to leave me?' "'Wish to? No, sir, my lord. I, I thought you'd maybe want a smarter valet, and not me.' My lord turned back to the mirror, and withdrew the pen from his cravat. "'Don't be a fool.' This cryptic remark seemed to greatly reassure Jim. "'You mean it, sir?' "'Of course I do. I should be lost without you after all this time. Marry that nice girl at Fittering.' and she shall maid my lady, for I am to be married as soon as may be. Ay, sir, my lord, I'm sure I'm very glad, sir, your lordship. Rose, sir, with the silver lacing. I think so, Jim. And, uh, cream. Very pale cream waistcoat. Broidered in with rose. There is one, I know. Yes, sir, your lordship. My lord eyed him despondently. Uh, Jim. Yes, your lordship. "'I'm sorry, but I cannot endure it.' "'I beg pardon, my lord. "'I can't have you call me your lordship after every second word. "'I really cannot. "'Why, sir, may I still call you sir? "'I would much rather you did. "'Aye, sir, thank you.' "'In the middle of tying the bow to his master's wig, "'Jim paused, and in the mirror Jack saw his face fall. "'What's amiss now? "'And what have you done with my patches?' "'In that little box, sir. Yes, that one. I was just thinking. Here's the hair's foot, sir. That I shall never be able to see ye hold up a coach now.' My lord, striving to affix the patch in just the right spot at the corner of his mouth, tried to control his features, failed, and went off into a peal of laughter that reached O'Hara in the room across the landing, and caused him to grin delightedly. He had not heard that laugh for many a long day. End of chapter 29. Recording by Tara Mendoza. Phoenix, Arizona. September 2011. Chapter 30 of The Black Moth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. THE BLACK MOTH by Georgette Hare CHAPTER Thirty, EPILOGUE His Grace of Andover sat at the window of his lodgings at Venice, looking down at a letter in his hand. The writing was his sister's. After a moment he drew a deep breath and broke the seal, spreading the sheets out upon the broad sill. "'My very dear Tracy, so you have gone again with no farewell to your poor sister, sir. I am indeed very offended, but I understand your reason. As soon as I set my eyes on Diana, I knew the truth, and recognized your dark beauty. I am monstrous grieved for you, dear. I quite love her myself, although she is very tiresomely lovely. But perhaps she is dark, and I am fair. We shall not clash. The homecoming was prodigious exciting. Andrew was present. Dicky, of course, and me. Mrs. Fanshawe, too, was there for she knew Jack abroad, and a monstrous queer old man, who was vastly fidgety, and overcome to see Jack. Then Sir Miles and his wife came, who I thought quite agreeable nice people, and Diana's father and aunt, rather bourgeois, but on the whole presentable. Everyone knows the truth now, but most people have been prodigious kind, and I scarce notice a difference in our reception. Dearest Dicky is gayer than he was wont to be, and more darling 
and I almost enjoy being a social outcast. When Diana is properly gowned, as should suit her position, but I grieve to say that she prefers to dress plainly, she will make a prodigious elegant countess. I have promised to conduct her to my own mantua-maker, which is very sacrificing, as I am sure you will agree. I know London will go crazy about her, and indeed those who have already seen her, which is Avon and Falmouth, are positively foolish. I make no doubt twill be very mortifying, but I suppose it must be born. She and Jack are prodigious happy together. It is most unfashionable, but so am I happy with Dick. So there are the pair of us, and we had best set fashion. Pray return soon, my dear Tracy. You cannot conceive how I miss you. I was surprised you went away with Mr. Fortescue. I had no notion you were so friendly. With dearest love, your sister, Lavinia. P.S. Twill interest you to hear that Miss Gunning is to marry Coventry. Tis all over town this last week. Slowly his grace put the sheets together and handed them to Fortescue, who had just come into the room. These, from my sister, may possibly interest you, Frank. Fortescue read the letter through, and at the end folded it and handed it back in silence. Tracy laid it down on the table at his elbow. I began wrongly, he said. Yes, assented his friend. She was not that kind of girl. But having begun wrongly, I could not undo the wrong. So you made it worse, said Fortescue gently. I would have married her, in all honour. In your own arrogant fashion, Tracy. As you say, in my own arrogant fashion, Frank. If I could go back a year, but where's the use? I am not whining. Presently I shall return to England and make my bow to the Countess of Wensham. Possibly I shall not feel one jealous qualm. One never knows. At all events, I'll make that bow. You will. Frank looked sharply down at him. Nothing more, Tracy. You do not purpose. Nothing more. You see, Frank. I love her. I crave your pardon. Yes. She would not take you, but she has, I think, made you. As I once told you. When love came, you would count yourself as naught, and her happiness as everything. For a moment his grace was silent, and then back came the old smile, still cynical, yet with less of a sneer in it. How very pleasant it must be, Frank, to have one's prophecies so happily verified. He purred. Allow me to felicitate you. The End End of Chapter 30 End of the Black Moth Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, September 2011 Tara Mendoza at Q.com